As we get right to work here, we note a couple of streaks in progress. The world champion A's have now won nine consecutive postseason games, while the Bo Sox have now dropped nine straight. And the last victory celebration uh, dates back there to game five of the 1986 World Series against the New York Mets, and you know what happened after that. The record is 11 straight postseason losses set by the Phillies, and I suppose if there's any consolation, the Red Sox can not break that record this year. So how do you uh, stop the streak? Well, you turn to your stopper, and in Boston's case, that's Roger Clemens, who was both valiant and effective in game one. The A's simply counter with Dave Stewart, who actually won the opener. And uh, Jim Gray, as we swing it out across the continent to you, even the decision to start the rocket is not as simple as it might appear, right? Well, that's exactly right, Pat. You know, the Red Sox are no longer talking about winning this series. They're simply talking about winning a game. Of course, they were swept by the A's back in 1988, and they don't want a repeat of that. But there is some controversy, and that has to do with the A's starting pitcher, Dave Stewart. He's questioning why the Red Sox would choose Roger Clemens after just three days rest, and he's wondering why they would risk their franchise. I would think that if you have an athlete as special as Roger Clemens, that you would try to do what you could to protect him, to keep him strong, to keep him healthy. Um, I just don't see the point in risking his physical condition for one ball game when the chances of them winning this is not very likely. That's a, that's a pretty harsh assessment by Dave Stewart, but you know, Clemens teammates say he's simply obsessed with wanting to beat Dave Stewart, and he wants the opportunity today. Roger's smart enough not to risk, you know, maybe maybe a $25 million contract. Uh, I don't think uh, Roger would risk that if he didn't think he was ready. I think, you know, Roger, I've talked to him. He wants to go out there. He says he's going to try to have a lot of fun. It'll be interesting to see just how long Clemens goes today. But you know, Pat O'Brien, things have gotten so tough on the Red Sox that Joe Morgan told me that last night when he went to his own post-game interview, the usher wouldn't let him into the interview area <laughs> because he did not have a pass. Let's go back to you in New York. He gets a uh, post-game victory under his belt. Maybe they'll give him a key. Thank you, uh, Jim. And on deck here, we'll check in with Eric the Red, who dropped an anvil on the Steel City last night as our coverage of baseball's league championships rolls on from bay to beautiful bay here on CBS. Let's play two. Well, the Red Sox taking batting practice earlier today, and I guess you say to yourselves, do they ever need this or what? See for yourself, though. These guys led the major leagues in batting, and look at this 74-point plunge in the postseason. What do the world champions do? Well, they raise their game, or at least their team batting average, by 66 points during crunch time. And hey, they haven't even hit a home run yet. Well, so it's not actually up their sleeves, it's on their sleeves. And folks, that is an elephant. Time machine time as we meet Cornelius McGillicuddy, Connie Mack for short. He spent a fortune on players, clearly ahead of his time. And John McGraw dismissed Mr. Mack's Philadelphia Athletics as a bunch of white elephants. By the end of the Roaring Twenties, the elephant was all but forgotten. That is until 1988, when the A's brass thought it was time to bring back the pack, a derm. And well, wouldn't you know it, they've packed a pennant in their trunks each year since. If we'd had a bad year the first year, they probably wanted to kick that elephant off the shirt. But as it turned out, we've played well with it. And I'm still waiting for the players to come up with a name. Uh, it hasn't been named yet. Well, I've heard of a player to be named later, but this is ridiculous. It's uh, just about time to take in the ball game. We'll send you out to the Bay Area. When we come back after a word from your local station, stay with us. To sweep, perchance to dream, and sweet dreams of a return to the fall classic are on the minds of those Bay Area bombers as we bid a good afternoon to Dick Stockton. Hello, Dick. And how are you, Pat? And the weather throughout this whole series has been as glorious as the performance of the Oakland A's. You know, when we talk to Tony La Russa, he keeps mentioning the crooked number. He says, we want to get the crooked number. That's any number more than one for runs, and he's been able to be successful with that. Meanwhile, the Red, the Red Sox have not been able to get the crooked number. They have one run in each of the first three games. And Jim Cott, let me ask you about that crooked number. Is that the big problem for the Red Sox? They've got to get some of those in this game? I think some of those early in the game would help, but it goes a little beyond that. I really think for the Red Sox to win the day, they have to play almost a perfect baseball game. No errors in the field. They've got to make better use of their base runners. Bunt them over, steal more bases, hit and run. And then a good job out of the bullpen today because Roger Clemens is going to start, but it's doubtful as to whether he could go nine innings. 
Well, it's going to be tough against the Oakland A's, a tremendous club that has won nine straight in postseason. And you look at the contribution of people like Baines and Randolph, who were not even with the club when the season started, and how they built this team. Well, and they built it also with a trade of a, of a man like Willie McGee. And all of the pitchers that you've seen the Oakland A's use in this series are either free agent signings or they've acquired in trade. None that they've developed through their system. And back to reality as far as the Red Sox are concerned, who they have lost nine straight in postseason. And no one imagined in April that they would be even in this position. No, I think they should feel good about just being in the playoffs. Toronto and Milwaukee were the teams that we thought we'd see here, but the Red Sox, to their credit, have played much better baseball than anyone expected. And here they're trying to beat a team that finished 15 games ahead of them during the year. Well, no team has ever come back from a 3-0 deficit in baseball in a seven-game series. We'll see what happens, of course. And Joe Morgan has shuffled up his lineup. We'll have that when we come back to Oakland. CBS Sports coverage of Game 4 of the 1990 American League Championship Series is brought to you by Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. AT&T, the right choice. And by Budweiser, with that clean, crisp, cold taste, nothing beats a Bud. It is 71 degrees and a beautiful afternoon for baseball here in the Bay Area, getting set for Game 4 of the American League Championship Series. Let's take a look at the Boston Red Sox starting batting order, and it's been shuffled up, although the same nine are in there. Ellis Burks will lead off and play center field. Jody Reed, who had been leading off, now hitting second. Wade Boggs remains in the number three slot. He's at third base. Mike Greenwell moves up to the cleanup position in left field. Tony Pena behind the plate, hitting fifth. Dwight Evans, the designated hitter, followed by Tom Brunanski in right field. Carlos Quintana, who had been hitting second, is dropped to number eight in the order. Quintana hitting eighth, and Luis Rivera, the shortstop, batting ninth for the Red Sox. Joe Morgan just wants to get a different look in there, and that's why he is shaking them up. Couldn't ask for better weather, and in the daytime, the ball carries, although we have only had one home run in this series thus far. That by Wade Boggs of the Red Sox in game number one, as the A's take the field. And in game four, the same alignment as Tony La Russa used yesterday. Ricky Henderson will play left field. Dave Henderson gets the start again in center. And Jose Canseco over in right field. On the infield, Carney Lansford at third base. And Mike Gallego replacing Walt Weiss at shortstop. Veteran Willie Randolph, the hero of yesterday's game, plays second base. Mark McGuire over at first. Terry Steinbach will do the catching. Dave Stewart will do the pitching, trying to set a record in league championship play. Let's bring you up to date on what we've seen so far. The Oakland starters have been magnificent, allowing only three runs in 21 and a third innings. And their relievers, well, Dennis Eckersley has two saves, and the Red Sox bullpen has struggled throughout. That's been a big Achilles heel for them. The Red Sox 0 for 17 with runners in scoring position. They have not gotten a hit when they've had runners in scoring position and they've had a one nothing lead in all three games. And I think today you see what Oakland has done with just 32 hits 29 singles. I mean you're looking at a team that is known as the Bashers and yet the Red Sox have more extra base hits but they have not been able to take advantage of their base runners. Dave Stewart who was the winning pitcher in game one working eight innings. The Red Sox had base runners on in five of those innings and a guy who wants the ball kind of a you know a throwback. Every fourth day, three days rest is all Stewart needs. Yeah, he's had a couple of starts on three days rest. One time he went 11 innings and beat Seattle and went into the ninth inning of the other one. So he loves, as most pitchers years ago did, he loves working on the fourth day. Dave Stewart's a throwback for another reason. You look at your pitchers like Gibson and Marischal and some of the greats. Uh, they they were vulnerable early in the ball game, but once they got rolling through the middle part, they got a lot tougher. Terry Cooney will call balls and strikes today. Big Voltaggio will be at first base. Larry McCoy, the umpire at second, and Rich Garcia at third. And down the lines, it'll be John Hirschbeck in left and Jim Evans in right. And we're set to go, and Ellis Burks will lead off. He is three for 11 in the series. And the first pitch of the game from Dave Stewart is taken for a ball inside. Burks was a leadoff hitter in game three of the 88 championship series. That's the game the Red Sox scored five runs. 
but ultimately lost here in Oakland. Fastball, it's popped out of play, and it's one and one. As Joe Morgan said, that the names haven't changed. You just juggle it around, and it's kind of a psychological ploy. Give the team a little different look, and maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Well, it got him five runs in game three two years ago. Two balls in a strike. And there's one away. Now you're going to look at two pitchers again today with that classic motion. See the, the leg kick and the hip turn. Show the hitter your hip pocket and watch that front foot right toward the target. When they pick that knee up, Clemens and Stewart, it's like they're going to knee themselves in the stomach. You don't want to swing that leg around. You want to pick it up. We'll get a good look at that. Stare by Stewart as the game wears on. Here's Jody Reed with one out in the first inning, takes a strike. Reed has collected only one hit in 11 at bats in the first three games. And as you can see, has done well against Stewart in the past, but Stewart's ahead on the count. No balls and two strikes. Stewart has won his last nine decisions against the Red Sox. Ground ball to third, loved by Carney Lansford. Reed is out, two down. Now Lansford once again in that ideal position, the glove down on the ground, weight up on the balls of the feet. Third baseman doesn't have to have foot speed, but he's got to have good lateral movement like the great Brooks Robinson of the Orioles in years past and Lansford has that two down and Wade Boggs the batter at five for 12 has been the most productive hitter for the Red Sox in this series if you want to call getting three runs in three games productive he takes a fastball for a strike he has a homer against Stewart and a double in the series. Pitches outside, one and one. Stewart with a 22 and 11 year. And in his personal matchup with Clemens, seven and one lifetime. Fouled off the mask of Terry Steinbach, and the count is one and two. And if he were to win today's game, he would have five victories in league championship series play, and that would be a record. He was four and zero oh in postseason in four starts. Check swing, but a ground ball into right field, sort of a half swing, and Wade Box has his sixth hit of the series, a two-out base hit. Well, this is a great example of a pitch down and in. Down and in from a right-hand pitcher to a left-hand hitter is the easiest pitch to get the barrel of the bat on. Look what, how Boggs doesn't take a hard swing, but it's so easy to drop the barrel on that pitch. That's why you pitch guys high and tight, low and away. You don't pitch them down and in. He just kind of golfs that into right field. That brings up Mike Greenwell, who is still looking for his first hit in this LCS. Two out box at first, which is up and away ball one. Greenwell and Quintana, both hitless thus far in this series. There's a strike on the corner, and it's one and one to Mike. Red Sox have Scored three runs. Boggs is homer accounting for one and two other runs scored on sacrifice flies. That's been it. Al out of play. I mentioned Joe Morgan shaking up the lineup today and it was it was his words. He says hey maybe it'll work maybe it won't. He has got a real perspective on this game a way of putting things in reality. He knows that just juggling the lineup is not going to make Dave Stewart any less a pitcher but he wants to try something different. Here's the one two pitch and a line drive right at Willie Randolph to retire the side. Greenwell hit it solidly. No runs a hit, one left. The Red Sox don't score in the A's coming to back. Well, 
the A's coming to bat in the first inning after the Red Sox go out. And they've juggled the lineup when they're at the uh, at bat, but in the field they line up the same. Greenwell, Burks, and Bernanski in the outfield and around the infield Boggs, Rivera, Reed, and Quintana. Tony Pena behind the plate doing the catching and the rocket. Roger Clemens will do the pitching. And the A's lineup, Ricky Henderson will lead off. Dave Henderson moves up to second in the order. Jose Canseco batting third. Harold Baines, the designated hitter. Carney Lansford is at third base. Terry Steinbach, the catcher. Mark McGuire playing first base. Willie Randolph, yesterday's hero at second base, at least one of them. And Mike Gallego, the shortstop, batting ninth for the A's. And concerning the A's, who are leading 3 0, as we look at Roger Clemens getting set, it's been 71 years since the team won a postseason series without hitting a home run. The 1919 Reds were the last team to do it, and right now we've had only one homer that hit by Wade Boggs. Here's Ricky Henderson. He has been caught once yesterday. He tried to steal third and was nailed, and there was some back and forth as whether that was a good move or not. Roger Clemens, first pitch of the game to Henderson, swings and a pop up, drifting foul and out of play. Tony Larusa gives Ricky a green light sign. That means he doesn't have to go, but he can go, referring to yesterday's game when Henderson was on second base. Tried to steal third, was thrown out with Mark McGuire at the plate. Tony said I probably shouldn't have given him the green light because it wasn't a high percentage play. That's one of those plays only good if you make it. And LaRusso owned up. Yep. Foul back. And the count no balls and two strikes. So Clemens is working with three days rest. Considerable concern as to whether he has any pain in his arm seems not to be the problem. His problem is conditioning right now. Infield and outfield playing Henderson straight away. Fly ball down the right field line and that'll go into the crowd. I can appreciate Dave Stewart's comments about Roger Clemens when he said hey if you're going to risk the franchise just by trying to win one game with in a series that they have very little chance but injury and I can see him saying that concern for Roger Clemens career but as you said injury is not the factor here it's fatigue it's leg leg strength conditioning he's only started three games in the last five weeks pitch is low because there were some ideas that maybe Clemens who may go six innings or so maybe seven you start somebody else bring him in I mean that's a wild idea but not out of the realm I wondered about that it's it's kind of a an unorthodox plan to start a Harris or a Bolton and see if you can get three innings out of him and then bring the rocket in in the fourth inning one two pitch Hop foul a lot of room here Carlos Quintana chases it and it lands in the first row. Similar to Stewart, you'll see the watch the knee almost like he's going to knee himself in the chest. Shows the hitter that back pocket and watch the front foot right toward the target. I mean, you're looking at a couple of examples of ideal pitching mechanics in Clemens and Stewart. You talk about not starting your pitcher and saving him for another day. That was used in the pennant race in 67. Dick Williams, who managed the Red Sox to the pennant that year of the impossible dream, gambled on Saturday with Jose Santiago. And held Lomborg back for the final day, and they won. Line drive, base hit to right field. Bernanski cuts it off. And Ricky Henderson is on board with his fifth hit of the series. So the base stealing threat is here early in this game. You get the idea from this at bat that Ricky Henderson has said, okay, some of the other guys have been getting it done. Willie Randolph, Dave Henderson, today is going to be my day. And he starts it out with a line drive single. So here's Dave Henderson, who returned to action. Remember, he had the knee surgery and came back in August. One for two with an RBI sacrifice fly yesterday. Takes the pitch, just missing inside 1-0. and oh. He also had a stolen base. The A's will not hit and run with Ricky Henderson. They feel that... Why waste that move if Henderson can steal second? and get over there himself. 
Clemens has done a little better job abbreviating that leg kick to get the ball to Pena and give him a chance to throw out Henderson. One ball and one strike to Dave Henderson. He's been a money performer. When the chips are down and the leaves begin to turn, he rises to the occasion. Good velocity on that pitch. Swung on and missed one and two. Renee Latchman, former Red Sox third base coach, is over there for the A's. Dave McKay is man's the first base coaching line. See Ricky with that little jump step right there at the last minute. He knows just how much he can take and still dive back in ahead of the tag. And that's his way of disrupting the pitcher. And he knows he can dive back safely. He has it all measured. Anderson in the last 10 years has averaged more than 80 stolen bases a season. That was a little closer. How much of a role does Pena have in inducing Roger Clemens to throw over there? Well, a lot of teams have a set sign. Pena might make this call on his own. If you see the pinky finger pointed that way, that usually means throw to first base. Round ball hit to the right side. Jody Reed over Rivera for one. The throw to first and the double play is turned by the Red Sox. And there are two down. Clemens not only made a great pitch to Dave Henderson, Reed, Rivera, and Quintana turned the double play smoothly, but he did an outstanding job of varying his count to Ricky Henderson and not allowing him to get a good jump to steal second base. By varying his count, he held the ball a count or two, then he delivered quickly. So two down to Jose Canseco. Hasn't really been himself in this series. He is hitless in three official trips with an RBI, but he has scored a run in each game. Play him to pull in the infield. The first pitch from Clemens is a strike. And I would think with that wide open stance that he's used to protect against the the back injury he can't turn quite as well that he's even going to have more trouble pulling the ball off Clemens off the fist and out of play and that was a 95 mile an hour fastball last two pitches have been right around that mark from Clemens Clemens walked for and struck out for in his game one outing that went six innings he also threw a wild pitch. Amazing story for Clemens, who came down with tendonitis of the shoulder, was out from September 4th until September 29th, came back and pitched six hitless or run the shutout innings against the Toronto Blue Jays in a big game for the Red Sox. Breaking ball, roll to second base, and Jody Reed is there, and the side is retired. There was a hit, none left. And we've completed one inning here at Oakland in game four, and there's no score. No score. Second inning here in game four. Game five scheduled for tomorrow night if necessary. That would mean the Red Sox would have to win. And the A's are one game away from capturing the William Harridge Award, the 1990 American League Championship pennant, and it would be their third pennant in a row. Remember, they won three world championships, 1972 through 74. Have to get the carpenter down there and enlarge that trophy case. They got a bunch of them going back to those teams of the early 70s, and now these in the late 80s and 1990. Well, it's good that the Oakland fans who don't have that football team the Raiders anymore nearly got him back still may someday they've got the baseball team Tony Pena leading off in the second inning against Dave Stewart takes strike one Pena is three for 11 in the series and all those hits came yesterday when he went three for four in the air to right field Canseco moving over toward the line was playing Pena perfectly and there's one away 
mentioned the Oakland fans, you know, it really isn't that long ago, maybe in the mid 80s, when there was talk of this franchise moving out of here, maybe even going down to Florida. That's hard to believe now with the success they've had in recent years. Not going to go anywhere for a long time with this organization. Here's Dwight Evans. He has one of the Red Sox extra base hits in this series. Victim of Dennis Eckersley's artistry for the second game in a row yesterday. Strike one. Now Dave Stewart threw harder farther into the game in game one. He had his fastball in the 90s. Well into the seventh or eighth inning and coming back on four days rest from the look of it today. He hasn't lost any speed at all. He's ahead of Evans 0 and 2. And Dwight gets a piece of it and also that gets a piece of his leg. Once again no protective guard down there. Some hitters use it because once you hit on top of that ball down and in that's exactly where it'll go. And I mean I think it'll become standard equipment when you see a few more of those and some foot injuries. A ball and two strikes now to Evans on deck for the Red Sox is Tom Brunanski. There's Bruno. In the air to right center field. And it's caught by Willie Randolph. Fine play by Randolph. The veteran is doing it in the field as well as at bat. And there's two away, and the A's continue to make all the plays in this series. Wow, Randolph and Conseco could smile about it now, but what a miraculous catch because the ball was actually over Willie's right shoulder, and you see him looking over his left shoulder. And so he had to reach back like a wide receiver running down the sideline and trying to stay in bounds. And he did stay in bounds and caught the ball. Not committed an error in 42 postseason games. Good to have experience like that on your roster. Stewart gets ahead of Bernanski strike one. Two out nobody on base. The Red Sox hitting in the second inning of a scoreless game. Fouls it off and it's 0 and 2 to Bernanski who has only one hit in nine trips. In the series he's knocked in a run by virtue of a sacrifice fly. Strike three. First strike out of the game for Stewart. One, two, three inning. And in the middle of the second inning, no score. Each side is base hit as the A's face Roger Clemens in the second inning. Is he as superstitious as some other managers? Okay, with all the organized planning, underneath that jersey is a T-shirt that says Minnesota won't forget the POWs MIAs. That started by third baseman from the Twins, Gary Gaetti. A lot of flags flying around stadiums in the American League, and Tony has that T-shirt on. He's had it on the first three days. Why take it off now? Harold Baines takes the ball. He has been a big factor in the A's 3-0 lead. He's been on base seven times in the series and has driven in three runs. Right around the center of all the rallies that the A's have staged. Two balls and no strikes. Fastball is outside. Lemons has had his problems with Harold Baines, who's hitting over 300, plus a home run career wise against Roger. Bowles his fastball out of play, and the count now is two and one. Talking about LaRusso's superstition, you know, there are a lot of managers that really do the same thing or try to that Tony LaRusso does. He organizes his talent, he delegates authority to his coaches, and he pays attention to detail. His owners provide him with a lot of good players. And a high pop up may be playable, and Wade Boggs looking up in the sun makes the catch. The sun. As it was yesterday could prove troublesome for infielders and outfielders alike. Well there's one out. If the Red Sox can win today then we'll be back tomorrow night at eight o'clock Eastern for game five tomorrow. Bob Welsh who would be pitching with three days rest will get the call for the A's and Rick Harris the right hander. 
who would have pitched today had the Red Sox won yesterday. He'll be on the mound for Boston. Line drive, base hit to center field by Carney Lansford. And he continues to pepper Red Sox pitching. That's his seventh hit in 14 trips. One of the things hitters look for early in the game from Clemens, what is he going to go to? Because he has an outstanding football. Sometimes he'll start the game off throwing a lot of off-speed pitches. But today, mostly heat, and the A's hitters are ready for it. Lansford's aboard, the second hit of the game off of Clemens, and here is Terry Steinbach. Scored a big run yesterday when he jarred the ball loose from Tony Pena at home. Swing and a miss, strike one. That was in the sixth inning when the A's scored two runs to open up a lead to four to one. That was the eventual final score. That's Lansford with the lead at first. One ball and one strike. Probably see from both teams a little motion on offense early in this game. Steinbach is a good man for Tony La Russa to hit and run with. They'd like to get that first run. A lot of people talking about the obsession that Roger Clemens has in trying to beat Dave Stewart. I think it goes deeper really than just Dave Stewart. Ball and it's one and two. And so much talk about Clemens pitching on four days. I mean, uh, pitching on four days has been normal in baseball for years and years. I just think Roger wants to to come out and give his teammates a big effort and win a game and give them some hope of maybe winning Game Five and going back to Boston. Certainly, people don't think that's possible. Here's the one-two pitch. In tight, two balls and two strikes to Steinbach. A lot of people wonder why Clemens would get the call in any event in a game like this when it's three nothing. But you got to go with your best man if he wants to go and if he feels good enough. Yeah, and this by pitching game four, if they win, he could pitch in game seven. Foul back. Talk about the bright day. You don't often see pitchers wearing that eye black underneath their eye. Of course, he's got that linebacker stare. And he's built pretty sturdily at that. 2 2 pitch in the dirt, blocked in front by Pena, no advance. And the count is full down to Steinbach, three balls and two strikes. One out. Arnie Lansford singled up the middle. He's on at first base, and on deck is Mark McGuire. McGuire has had nothing but misery facing Roger Clemens throughout his career. Three balls and two strikes. No score here in the bottom of the second inning. And the runner goes. Lansford is off and the pitch is fouled back. Tony La Russa trying to get something going here to jump ahead. That's one thing the A's have not been able to do in this series. They have trailed in all three games just by a single run. Wait, a, a pretty good swing right there for a 3-2 pitch by Terry Steinbach. Usually more of a defensive swing in that count, but he was very aggressive. And Lansford is off again, and the pitch again fouled back. One of the things you worry about in championship series is gripping the bat too tight or gripping the ball too tight. But not Terry Steinbach. He's got a nice, loose, comfortable grip. In fact, so loose, throws the bat back to the backstop. Just missed home plate umpire Terry Cooney. You don't often see the bat slip directly behind, do you? They throw it out in the infield somewhere. Now that's one of the old phrases in teaching hitting. Throw the head of the bat at the ball. Steinbach did it right there. 
Lansford has taken off on the last two pitches that have been fouled off. Here he goes again, and the pitch is lying to left field. It's a base hit. Greenwell firing into third and safe at third as the ball gets away. Moving to second base is Steinbach, and he'll go in there, and the A's have runners at second and third. It'll be a base hit, and an error will be charged somewhere. Wow, here's a veteran, Carney Lansford, after a great at-bat by Terry Steinbach. I mean, this is a solid single, and not many guys would go from first to third. Lansford rounds second, and then he just catches Greenwell hesitating for a split second. That's all he needs. And Lansford isn't blessed with the greatest speed, but he's an outstanding base runner. That was an example of it. And Joe Morgan is coming out to the mound with runners at second and third. They have Mark McGuire coming up who lifetime is 067 against Roger Clemens and Willie Randolph to follow. And McGuire is a good opportunity for him to hit a fly ball and even if he doesn't get a base hit to put the A's in front. The error has been charged on Mike Greenwell's throw to third and that allowed Steinbach to go to second base. So the Red Sox commit their fifth error of the series. A's are still flawless in the field. Like Joe Morgan, first of all, with a little conference with Jody Reed and Rivera, like maybe they're going to change the signs. And I wonder whether they're concerned. I mean, anytime Roger Clemens begins to get hit, you think, well, something's wrong. And one of the things in that conversation could have been, hey, maybe they're getting our sequence of signs. Let's. Now they thought maybe Lansford missed second base. That was it. Larry McCoy says no. So the A's are threatening against Roger Clemens early here in the second inning and Mark McGuire who has only two hits in the series fouls it back for a strike Lansford is at third base Steinbach at second with one out in the second inning. only two hits and 30 times at bat against Roger Clemens career wise and you see how many times he has struck out and those that saw game one know the reason Clemens has that great high fastball McGuire is a low ball hitter so the high fastball get by him gives him the high fastball fouled back that was 94 miles an hour and he's ahead of McGuire one and two Willie Randolph waiting on deck. Here's the one-two pitch. Two balls and two strikes. McGuire took a look out at Clemens <laughs> as that pitch sailed towards his head. Kind of shook his head, said it sounded kind of close. Not, not quite chin music, about Bill of the Cap. Music. Not really as close as Mark McGuire thought it was, but from Roger Clemens, don't blame him for ducking. Ground ball hit to the hole, a throw to third base. The tag is made, but the run is going to score as Steinbach is retired. Carney Lansford comes in on McGuire's fielder's choice ground ball, and it's one to nothing A's. It's the first time the A's score first in this series. Well, Mark McGuire gets a ball down to put the bat on it. Rivera with a heads up play here. Evidently the contact and run immediately play was on for the A's because Steinbach runs into an easy out at third. The run sign I'm sure was on for Carney Lansford. If Terry Steinbach would have been better off right here staying at second base and making Rivera make that long throw to first. Lansford scores one to nothing Oakland. And that'll bring up Willie Randolph with two outs and McGuire the base runner at first. That's a fielder's choice. And it was Rivera to Boggs for the out on Steinbach at third. Randolph with two hits and two RBIs last night already has made the defensive play of the game. Two balls no strikes to Willie.
Clemens falls behind Randolph three and zero. Oh. People were wondering why Roger Clemens had to be taken out in the sixth inning a decision made by Joe Morgan in game one but the A's had threatened in the fourth fifth and sixth innings of that first game. And that's it for a strike. Wow. Randolph was on his way down to first. He really said you sure. Talked about the lack of high strikes being called that Terry Cooney rang that one up, up above the belt. In fact that was looked like above the letters. And that's ball four. Randolph is on. That's the first walk given up by Clemens. Runners at first and second. Right now, let's go down to the field and get a report from Jim Gray. Jim? Okay, thank you, Dick. This is the practice glove of Mike Gallego, but come game time, he uses the same glove that he's used for the last eight years. He's a leather freak. Uses a lot of meek oil, toils with all the A's gloves. He says if Linus can have his blanket, he can keep his glove. Let's go back upstairs to you. All right, Jim. And here is Mike Gallego, who is three for seven in the series. A's with runners on first and second. That's McGuire at second, Randolph at first. And Terry Cooney arguing with Tony Pena. And Joe Morgan gets into the fray now. And you don't often see a manager get thrown in a playoff or a series. Weaver has, Earl Weaver in the past. I thought that possibly it was a balk call. And Cooney came from behind home plate. I mean, Morgan is livid, and I'm wondering whether he's ejected Clemens. First of all, the scouting report on the umpires, and yeah, this is a rotation system. You don't get the six top-rated umpires, but Terry Cooney is one, if you ask managers and players, has a very short fuse, tends to get upset a little easily, and this is an example of it. Well, could you believe it? I mean, you say they just threw, they just threw something out towards Vic Voltaggio. Well, Clemens, ooh, be careful. Clemens is coming after Cooney because I think he just realized Cooney has ejected him. Obviously, Clemens was shouting some things down at Cooney about the questionable balls and strikes. I got to tell you, even though you're not allowed to do that, in a game like this, you don't throw out a pitcher like this. You know, umpires used to be like your grandfather. They'd walk away, they'd let you have a say. And let you get it out of your system, but now they're like the spoiled little kid down in the corner of the block. You know, and they get cocky and arrogant, and this now, is an example of it. Now, a Red Sox coach and player got tangled up in the dugout now. The question is, did Terry Cooney throw out Roger Clemens? I can't imagine it wasn't Roger Clemens. If it was somebody else, Clemens wouldn't be the guy trying to get at him. I mean, it's absolutely absurd to throw a guy out in a situation like this, a game of this magnitude. That could be the only thing that has the Red Sox acting like that, throwing things from the dugout and Morgan and Clemens trying to go after the umpire. Now I saw Clemens go to his mouth, and I'm wondering whether maybe the initial call was that Cooney said Clemens went to his mouth or walked or something in regard to that. Doubt they would have this much of an argument over something that might have. Tony La Rosa just looks on as the Red Sox have exploded. They have gone out of control. Roger Clemens, Morgan, and the dugout. John Hirschbeck, the umpire in your picture, along with Tony Pena, trying to calm Roger down. Here's the look at, at the start of it. Here's Clemens. And he's saying something right there to Terry Cooney. And obviously, in reference to Cooney's strike zone, the, the first pitch to Randolph, the 3-0 pitch, the high one, was called a strike. The next one was in the same place. He called it a ball. We haven't seen any movement in the Red Sox dugout or bullpen as far as getting somebody else up to throw. 
I would think that the least would be the warning. I don't I don't care what Clemens said. If he didn't come running down off the mound, I mean this is this a is, shame. I think he used the right word, absurd, totally yeah. absurd. If he indeed is out of this game. You, the players are emotionally involved. The umpires don't have to be. It's just their job to give both teams an honest chance to win. And there's no need for that kind of reaction from an umpire. I'll guarantee if the late Nestor Shylock or Charlie Berry or Ed Hurley were in control of this game, you wouldn't see that happen. All right, Jim Gray is down there. Let's see what he knows. Jim? Okay, Dick, I just had an opportunity to speak to some of the Red Sox players over there. They said that Roger Clemens has been upset with the strike and ball zone the entire game and then he had a couple of comments for the umpire and all of a sudden he was just heave out of the game. Now all the Red Sox are very upset because this say, they say this is a playoff game and you can't throw a guy out for arguing balls and strikes. Let's go back upstairs to you. I think at least you get a warning and the umpire comes out and says look one more word from you and you're gone and you do it that way. Yep. I don't think he got that kind of a warning from Terry Cooney. Once again the this is Clemens jawing with Terry Cooney and, and this is nothing new. Umpires will usually come out and warn you or say something. Hey, all right, you've had your say. That's enough. This is nothing new to, to argue a little bit. But to come out in a playoff game as a home plate umpire. And of course, I mentioned when you, when you talk to players and managers and you follow the league all season, you find out the personalities of different umpires. And this is no in no regard a comment on Terry Cooney's ability as an umpire. It's his temperament. It's his judgment. Unbelievable. Yeah, that's. Roger Clemens isn't through. Well, you can bet that whoever Joe Morgan brings in right now, and it appears that Tom Bolton is trotting in from the bullpen, he will drag this thing out, and of course, Bolton will get as much time as necessary. It is just hard to fathom that in a championship game in a series like this an umpire would become the man on the center stage and not the player not the exactly. pitcher in a situation like this and Roger Clemens whether you're an A's fan or a Red Sox fan I think the A's feel bad because it robs the fans and even the A's of trying to compete against the great pitcher we'll be back to the Coliseum in a moment. A bizarre development here at Oakland Coliseum. Roger Clemens has been thrown out of the game. Tom Bolton is warming up, has as much time as he wants. Right now, let's go to the New York studios and Pat O'Brien. Pat? All right, Dick, thank you very much. Uh, we're joined now by, uh, you've probably been calling him Don Denkinger all your life. It's Don uh, Denkinger, an uh, American League uh, umpire for uh, 22 years, been in the business. What's your assessment of this situation, Don? Well, what I saw happen was that uh, Roger said something to Terry Cooney that was personal. I mean, he swore at him, and you just don't let him swear at you personally because you have another team out there that can also hear it. And it had to be audible or he wouldn't have thrown him out. And a lot of uh, people are saying, well, it's the magnitude of the game. You, you don't change the rules because of the magnitude of the game. Uh, the rule says you cannot argue balls and strikes with an umpire. Uh, you let the pitcher uh, question you once in a while, but uh, you won't let him get personal with you. You don't and give him any, any kind of a break at all in this no, situation? Absolutely not. You can't let him swear at you. I mean, he had to say something about Terry personally. Mm -hmm. And that's what automatically would get you ejected from the baseball. Well, game. what about a warning then? I mean, I'm, I'm well, we we're don't not have warnings. sides here. But I understand just, that. Yeah. We just don't have warnings. You know, it, uh, you don't, not when they get personal with you. That gets, that's the, the key thing that happened there is that he got personal with Terry Cooney. Right. And you can't do that. He, you know, he could have said something about the balls and strikes, but he cannot say something about Terry Cooney. All right. So quickly again, for all those people up in Boston who are arguing someplace now, what exactly is the rule once again? Let's well, the, the rule states that you cannot argue balls and strikes with an umpire. Period. Uh, we will let a pitcher question balls and strikes, but we will not let a pitcher or anybody else in that field come to us personally and call us names. Yeah. And that's what had to happen. Roger right. had to say something personal to uh, Terry Cooney. Don, thanks for your expertise. Uh, that's it from here, Dick. Back to you. All right, thank you very much, and it's good to see Don Denkinger, who I remember worked his first uh, postseason game in 75 of the Red Sox A series, and uh, what are your thoughts of Don uh, Denkinger's thoughts? Well, I, I think uh, Don's words about getting personal are certainly true, 
And I know that umpires have a have a difficult job to do in a, in a game of this magnitude. He says it doesn't make a difference. But I guess over and above the rule, what I what I think of when I think about you know the late Charlie Berry and, and Nestor Shylock and guys like that is that common sense would take place and you would step out and say hey the guy is pumped up he's in the game yeah he said he did something he shouldn't do but I'm going to go out there I'm going to say Roger cut it you know that that's enough I mean as far as swearing and, and calling names and things like that since Abner Doubleday invented this game there's been a little bit of that going on I can appreciate the rule and and Don's feeling about that but I, I can't see why there wouldn't have been a warning and say Roger I've heard enough knock it off which is what I, I think a lot of umpires would do and then if he does it again history even though Don uh, said that there is no warning does an umpire right. have the right to give a warning anyway well I, I think Don could answer that but I'm looking at beyond the rule book here and some common sense and I, I mean there's a lot of things in the rule book if you talk to umpires they'll say well you could interpret it this way or that way it says this in the rule but you know common sense tells me to do that and so I think right here common sense said warn Roger and, and, and then if he does it again He's out of there. One other question before we go down to Jim Gray. Have you ever been in a situation as a pitcher where you saw another pitcher say something personal to an umpire and not get thrown out? Well, I've had some. I guess the only umpire during my career in the American League, and I had never had any problems with, with Don, but Bill Haller. Bill Haller was a good guy, but we just, you know, had some battles and uh, had our, our say. Let's go down to the field and Jim Gray. Okay, Dick, I was just on the side of the Red Sox dugout. Roger Clemens came by and said he doesn't know why he was thrown out of the game. He was given no warning. He was just jawing with the umpire. Got absolutely no warning. He says there's a double standard. They're allowed to talk to the umpires, and I'm not, and that's not right. Let's go back upstairs to Dick. Thank you very much, Jim. And so Tom Bolton has warmed up enough, and now he is going to be pitching to Mike Gallego with the A's with runners at first and second and two out. A shocking bizarre development here in game number four of this series as Roger Clemens was thrown out of the game here in the second inning by home plate umpire Terry Cooney no count and two out pitch to Gallego is a curveball misses one and oh Bolton faced one batter in the first game of the series pitched the third of an inning has not seen any action since McGuire the runner at second Randolph at first and the pitch is taken for a ball two and oh four players have been ejected previously in league championship series play Bert Campanaris and Laren Legro the famous bat incident between the A's and the Tigers Bruce Hurst and Jay Howell now Roger Clemens. I think this crowd is stunned. In for the strike two and one. So Tom Bolton, the left hander, 28 year old out of Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, it's really taken a lot of the focus away from what this game is being played for, the American League Championship. And all of a sudden, everybody's buzzing about the ejection of Roger Clemens. Runners at first and second and two down. And the pitch just misses outside. Three balls and a strike on deck, the top of the order, Ricky Henderson. There is Ricky. The A's lead one to nothing. They've scored here. And a fly ball, center field, deep going way back and over the head of center fielder Burks. Ball bounds around. McGuire scores. Here comes Randolph, and in its second with a two-run double is Mike Gallego, and it is now a three-to-nothing lead. As if things weren't tough enough for Joe Morgan and Roger Clements, Tom Bolton leaves the fastball up in the zone. Mike Gallego's a good high ball hitter, and with the warm conditions here this ball carries a little bit better than Ellis Burks thinks playing him shallow as you would and Gallego with a big two out double he's filled in for Walt Weiss and the A's never miss a beat he's filled in in every infield position so here's Ricky Henderson with Gallego at second curveball is in for strike one Henderson singled 
was out on a double play in the first inning. So it's three to nothing in favor of the A's. They've jumped on top of Clemens and now Tom Bolton. Both of those runs are charged to Roger Clemens. He holds up on the curve. They appeal to Vic Voltaggio and it's a ball one and one. So a lot of pressure unexpected pressure on Bolton who was 10 and 5 with the Red Sox in 16 starts. And we see Roger Clemens behind manager Joe Morgan wishes he had that towel over his mouth when he was on the mound. And now Terry Cooney explaining something to Ricky Henderson. And Renee Latchman the third base coach comes in. What's going on anyway. Richie Garcia who is uh, down on third base may have to get involved here and restore order. He's the umpire in this group that can take charge. Things back in order. One ball, one strike is the count. And a fastball is away, two and one. See, now you got Bolton staring in. Once a game gets a little bit out of control early for a home plate umpire, you can make for a very long afternoon. Joe Morgan's going to come out to the mound walking faster than usual. And this is a little ploy. He's going to wait till Terry Cooney gets to the mound, and I think you may see Joe Morgan explode. And every Red Sox infielder will join the conference at the mound. Boggs is walking in now. Cooney doesn't want to go out there. He's waiting. He's going to wait till he gets there. Joe might plant a few tomatoes out there while he's waiting. Well, here comes Cooney. This ought to be interesting. Oh, ho. <laughs> he's silent treatment. <laughs> he took an outside turn on Cooney, and Morgan goes back into the dugout. It's Roger Clemens, who started with three days rest, a lot of words about whether that was the smart move or not and he gets thrown out for arguing with Terry Cooney in the second inning. There's Mike Gallego who knocked in two runs with a double. Fouled at the plate by Henderson and the count is two balls and two strikes. Three runs are in here in the second inning and the A's who need one win to wrap up the American League pennant are in front three to nothing. Against the left-hander, the A's have exactly what they like. They have eight right-handed batters and only Harold Bain swinging from the left side. Yeah, the key right now for the A's and the Red Sox is to get your focus and your concentration back on the game. See Willie clapping his hands trying to get the A's in. Because of what's happened, everything has gotten so quiet to lose your train of thought. Strikes him out on a curveball, and that'll do it. In a wild second inning. The A's score three, however, and that'll stay in the books. Three to nothing over. Between innings, Rich Garcia, the third base umpire, conferring with American League president Dr. Bobby Brown. Now you can almost see Richie gesturing with his hands, and Dr. Brown's obviously interested in why did Clemens get ejected? You know, you mentioned the fans, and I got to say if I paid 35 bucks or whatever for a seat today and came out here primed to see Stewart and Clemens I'd be pretty disappointed at what's transpired. Well he followed the letter of the law to Terry Cooney. So Dave Stewart staked now to a three run lead as the Red Sox come up in the top of the third inning. Carlos Quintana hitting eighth today followed by Luis Rivera and then the top of the order Ellis Burks. Quintana hitless thus far with 11 times up. Waves at a breaking pitch 0 and 1. Stewart the first pitcher to win 20 games or more four years in a row since Jim Palmer in the mid 70s.
breaking ball and it's one and one this inning will tell you something about Stewart's concentration and focus because of all that happened the last inning. he's been sitting on the bench for a long time and it's popped up to short center field Randolph is going out but Dave Henderson makes the catch and we have one away we have had a beautiful view of the East Bay and the Coliseum here in Oakland California the Goodyear blimp Columbia based in Carson California Tom Mattis of Huntington Beach California is piloting the blimp today not a cloud in the sky here in game number four we have had been blessed with splendid weather both in Boston for the first two games and out here on the West Coast with one out here's Luis Rivera batting ninth shortstop holds up on the breaking pitch and it's one and zero. Oh. Last year Stewart was second to Brett Saberhagen in the Cy Young voting probably be second to Bob Welch this year. Mike Flanagan the left hand pitcher won the Cy Young Award with the Baltimore Orioles back in the 80s and pitched for several major league clubs he used to nickname the different Cy Young winners. Pass ball and a good one in on the fist and Rivera pops up to Mark McGuire in foul territory and there's two gone here in the third inning. What were some of those uh, nicknames? We'll find out. The batter, set up here there. There's Roger Ball Clemens. And see, when you're ejected, you can't sit on the bench, but Roger's not going to move. None of the umpires are going to make him move, so they will write up a report on him and send it to the league office. Here's Ellis Burks, who's hitting leadoff and popped up to McGuire and foul ground his first time up. Pitch is low ball one. In for the strike with a breaking pitch one and one. You know when uh, Palmer was winning all those Cy Youngs he, he was Cy Young. <laughs> and then uh, he got a little older and Flanagan called him Cy Old. And then Storm Davis was Cy Young because he was younger. And if you got released, you were Sayonara. I would say in Dave Stewart's case, he's he's definitely been Cy steady. <laughs> Always a Cy. And a pop-up going out as Gallego in short left field makes the catch in a one-two-three inning for Dave Stewart. And we'll return to the Oakland Coliseum after this message and a word from your local station. You know, it's truly a, a three ring circus in that second inning over at the Red Sox dugout they had thrown those uh, Gatorade baskets out now Dick Berardino the coach pulling Marty Barrett into the dugout Barrett also was ejected from the game along with Roger Clemens. Wow Dick Berardino just trying to calm Marty down Marty didn't want to have anything to do with it usually throw that Gatorade over one another when you win those containers and they were throwing three or four of those barrels out of there now Joe Morgan in the dugout talking with Jim Evans who is the first base umpire and they're what they're talking about there is Clemens cannot stay on the bench hey is Evans going to pick Roger Clemens up and move him Clemens says I got to the playoffs you kicked me out but I'm going to sit here and watch that's Terry Cooney the home plate umpire who tossed Clemens to start it all actually Jim Evans is the right field umpire today Well it's sure taken a lot of the suspense and electricity and what promised to be a, a great pitchers duel. Now Clemens is going to leave through the path going into the tunnel. Photographers surround him like he's a visiting dignitary and some mixed reaction from the fans. That's Tom How Bolton. about that Clemens walked back and a, a fan said can I have your hat and even in that moment of heat he flipped his cap up to the fan for a souvenir. <laughs> Baseball fever catch this you got it. Here's Dave Henderson he takes a strike Henderson grounded into a double play in the first inning. Mixing Tom Bolton.
Bolden allowed a double and Mike Gallego drove in two runs both charged to Clemens and then struck out Ricky Henderson to end the second inning. So it's Dave Henderson followed by Canseco and Baines here in the third. Off speed breaking ball and Henderson way ahead of that one and the count is two balls and two strikes. Bolton a big story this year for the Red Sox left unprotected on the 40 man roster no one had claimed him he was brought up from Pawtucket the Red Sox triple A farm in mid June drive hit out to right field charging as Brunanski makes a diving play and he makes the catch fine play by Tom Brunanski made a habit of that down the stretch for Boston great instincts in right field you make catches like this by getting the first step and just looks that ball right into the glove. If you if you slide straight forward, you don't make the play. But Bernanski has the agility to slide sideways, and the glove with the palm up, ball falls right in it. That's a good play. One away in the third inning. Here's Canseco. Canseco has to be looking at a possibility to break out of his slump against the curveballing left hand. See what Bolton has to say about it. One and one. In for the strike, one ball and two strikes. And Seiko has driven in one run in this series. And still looking for his first hit. Two balls and two strikes. Bolton had been a reliever till last year. Red Sox last season brought him up. He was 0-4 and then sent back to AAA. In there for a call. Strike three and Canseco goes down. And there are two out. Second strikeout for Bolton. We're at Oakland's Coliseum. Where the big story was the ejection of Roger Clemens. Arguing with Terry Cooney in the second inning. This is Dick Stockton and Jim Cott. The A's lead the Red Sox three to nothing. Trying to wrap it up in four straight and move on to the World Series. And Harold Baines takes a call strike. Baines fouled out to Wade Boggs his first time up. There's a fastball in there 0 and 2. You see a, a lot more strikes being taken by the A's. This is quite a quite a change in looking at Tom Bolton from three quarter arm on the left side than Clemens overhand fastball. How much difference is it with a club that's gearing themselves to facing a Roger Clemens and what he offers and then all of a sudden early in the game looking at something totally different. I think it's the moment of the game and what's happened in addition to the different look of Bolton. You know and Bolton as you mentioned uh, an opportunity he was at Pawtucket and like Dana Kicker the right hander and Greg Harris another right hander have that three four and five slot for the Red Sox have given them great production that's one of the reasons they're here. And yes the A's didn't plan on facing him so they're probably sitting in a bench on the bench right now saying hey be alive for the slow curve and talking about the movement on his fastball. Baines fouls it out of play the count to him is one and two. And the curveball bounced past Dave McKay the first base coach. So many more pitchers today are sinker slider and split finger. So when you see a Bolton who's really the standard equipment that pitchers had for years fastball overhand curve and change but that big overhand curve is a little different look. There's a fastball in tight that moves Baines back and the count is two balls and two strikes. Well you push hitters off the plate you see Pena's target push them off the plate that usually means come back outside. Tony La Russa told us before the game that this wasn't just a last minute idea to get Baines from Texas. They tried as far back as last winter to bring him over. Of course La Russa knowing him from their Chicago White Sox days. And they finally got their man. Two balls and two strikes with two outs. The base is clear. And a weak ground ball foul down the first baseline. You know talking about Bolton and his story. 
With all of that, he also had a battle back from surgery for reconstruction within the left kidney. That was a couple of years ago. He was on the disabled list. He's had a lot of obstacles. Like Dana Kicker, a guy that just finally is getting a chance to prove he can pitch in the big leagues, taking advantage of it. And keeping the hitters off balance thus far. Well, to give you an idea what a tough out Harold Baines is, the, the pitches that he's fouling off right here. Bolton's worked him inside, outside. And he went around, strike three. So Bolton has struck out three of the five batters he's faced, and we have completed three innings in Oakland. CBS Sports coverage of Game 4 of the 1990 American League Championship Series is brought to you by Oldsmobile. Stop by your Oldsmobile dealer and see what's new from the new generation of Oldsmobile. Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers, the best hamburgers and a whole lot more. And by Dr. Pepper and your local Dr. Pepper bottler. Dr. Pepper is just what the doctor ordered. And right now we're going to bring in Tim McCarver for his comment on the Roger Clemens ejection in the second inning. Tim? All right, Dick, I saw, uh, obviously, Clemens uh, talking and yelling at home plate umpire Terry Cooney. I think the, the major thing here, from the way I saw it, uh, does the punishment fit the crime? I mean, after all, in a, in a situation where you do have emotions heightened like that, a playoff game, Roger Clemens coming back, one of the only hopes for the Boston Red Sox. I mean, should a guy like Terry uh, Cooney, should he use his authority to eject Roger Clemens? I don't think so. And I also disagree with Don Dinkerger in the, in the studio when he said that catchers and pitchers and managers don't argue balls and strikes. Certainly a manager can be kicked out of a game if he directly argues a ball and a strike, but I was a catcher for 20 years, and I argued balls and strikes 10 times a game. I never showed the umpire up or tried not to, but I argued balls and strikes all the time and had pitchers do the same. All right, Tim, thank you very much. And uh, kind of goes along, Jim, with what uh, our viewers uh, have been on the thing. I think common sense, you said it first, this was not good common sense by Terry Cooney. There's a strike. What Timmy's talking about by not showing the umpire up for as long as I've been around baseball, you can say things to umpires, but don't jump up and down and get in their face and make it look like you're making them look bad. You can do it in a subtle way. Box grounds it up the middle, and he's on with a base hit with one out in the fourth inning. Jody Reed had fly to Canseco in right field to start the fourth. And the Red Sox have their second hit of the game. Second at bat replay of the first. Clemens again comes back with the look like maybe the fork ball or the breaking ball down and in. And Boggs drops the barrel on it for a second hit. Make that Dave Stewart through that pitch. Here's Mike Greenwell lined out to second baseman Willie Randolph. Takes a breaking ball for a call strike. Greenwell still hitless in this series. 0 for 11. He has scored a run, however. The A's lead it three to nothing. Three runs, four hits, and no errors. The Red Sox, no runs, two hits, and one error. There's a line drive, center field, and charging it and making the catch is Dave Henderson. That ball seemed to rise as it got out toward Dave, and there's two gone. So Greenwell has hit the ball on the, the head twice so far in this game. In the post-game press conference yesterday, which was shown to the entire stadium on the center field scoreboard, Joe Morgan just said, a little bit of Oakland luck, and we hit a lot of balls right at people. And Mike Greenwell today is an example of that. He has hit two line drives, and he's 0 for 2. Boggs the runner at first base, and that will bring up Tony Pena, hitting fifth today. He fly to right field and hits a bounding ball to second. Randolph goes to Gallego for the force. The side is retired. No runs to hit one left. And after three and a half innings, the A's lead it three to nothing. Well, our game summary, a uh, lot going on on and off the field away from the action. Roger Clemens and Marty Barrett ejected in the second inning. The A's scored three runs that inning and Dave Stewart sails along. 
with four scoreless innings. And Carney Lansford leading off in the bottom of the fourth fouls off the first offering from Tom Bolton for a strike. Lansford singled to center field and scored one of the Oakland three runs in the second. Ground ball, the shortstop, and Rivera is there. One gone. And now settling back into baseball after all the excitement over Clemens' ejection, Tom Bolton's job is to just keep things right where they are. He's had a, an inning now to settle in, and if he can keep the Red Sox, if they could miraculously pull this game out, what would that do for him with the prospect of looking at Clemens? I mean, who knows? He might pitch tomorrow, or if they put it to game, you'll, they'll see him again. He'll run out to that mound. Here's Terry Steinbach. He takes ball one inside. He singled the left field, advanced on an error, then was thrown out. When he tried to go to third, Rivera to box. When McGuire got a, the first run home on a fielder's choice. One ball and one strike to count to Steinbach, who has four hits in the series for the A's. He's low with it, two and one. Steinbach has caught three of the four games thus far. Ron Hassey behind the plate, as he usually is when Bob Welsh worked in game two. Swing and a miss with a slow curve. Two balls and two strikes. Dominant right hand hitting lineup, and you'd think a left hander doesn't have a chance. Look at this curveball that Steinbach swings over. A lot of times, even good right hand hitters would rather face a right hand pitcher they don't pick the ball up as easily off left handers they have a little bit of an unusual motion here's a fastball drilled into center field for a base hit Steinbach now with five hits in this series Lansford leads with six and Terry is two for two in this game and Mark McGuire you can buy the Mark McGuire button and other souvenirs from this stand and many others. And here's Mark. Drove in the first run on a fielder's choice in the second inning. The lead by Steinbach. Two hits now off of Tom Bolton. Starts him off with a fastball. 1-0. Check the swing. They appeal to Vic Voltaggio in the count. Two balls and no strikes. And McGuire here, who may be the happiest of all the A's that Clemens is no longer in the game, considering his troubles, could get a good pitch to hit. Fouls it off, and it was a good pitch for him. Mentioned that McGuire likes the ball down. And of course, Bolton right now in this situation really wants it down sinking away to get the double play that was, that's always an interesting decision for a pitcher when you see a guy that's a low ball hitter and you're a low ball pitcher and then you try to pitch him lower than low you get it down around the shins and hope he'll chase it and hit it on the ground you don't want to get it in the dirt with a runner on foul ball off to the right the count two balls and two strikes Bolton did not make any appearances against the A's this year. He has never started a game against Oakland. Back in 87, he pitched an inning against the Athletics. Throw to first base. The A's have had runners on in every inning except for the third, last inning. Steinbach with the lead. Breaking ball misses away, and the count runs full to McGuire. Three and two. The on deck hitter is Willie Randolph. And there goes the runner. The pitch taken inside ball four. So Mark McGuire who led the league in bases on balls draws another one here and the runners are now at first and second and one out first walk and first walk given up by Bolton
Tonight at 8 o'clock Eastern time, Tom Browning goes to the mound against Doug Drabeck. Good man for the Pirates to have with his team on the brink. Got their best uh, going, the Pirates do, and Tom Browning battling back from an ankle injury that he had earlier in the year. Tonight at 8 o'clock, Jeff Gray is up and throwing in the Boston bullpen, and Joe Morgan is coming out now. Willie Randolph was the last batter that Roger Clemens faced. He's coming up with runners at first and second. Gray just got up to begin to toss, so I would not think that Morgan is going to make a move here. And then, of course, once he returns to the dugout, he's got to allow Bolton to face Randolph. So I think more than anything, just buying a little extra time. And quite honestly, like a lot of us and a lot of fans, to hear today you're burning up a lot of frustration a lot of energy because of what happened by that man's decision Terry Cooney and Joe has paraded back and forth a couple times now let's see Morgan is going to avoid Cooney Rich Garcia enters the picture The A's lead at three to nothing, and uh, this game has a long way to go. They're batting here in the fourth, but uh, pointed out a lot of the tension and expectation, even in a three nothing series of a Clemens Stewart battle, has been dissipated here at Oakland Coliseum, and that has to affect the fans as well. I, mean, I don't know if many people thought the Red Sox would win four games to win the series, but uh, they wanted to see the pitching matchup, and the ejection took care of that. Steinbach, the runner at second. McGuire on at first with one out. Randolph, who drew a walk and scored a run, the batter. Infield, a double play depth. Ball one outside. Curveball, one and one. Randolph was acquired from the Dodgers in a deal that sent outfielder Stan Javier to L.A. ball out of play saw that sequence of signs by Tony Pena as sometimes high tech or complicated as this game might appear one's a fastball two's a curve three's a slider you wiggle the fingers for a change those pitches are all the same it's just a matter of which sign Bolton and Pena are using first yeah. second third and the pinky throw yeah. over the first base oftentimes count as a ball and two strikes to Randolph with two runners on and one out Ball hit down the right field line, twisting foul and out of play. Talking about Stan Javier, the outfielder who went to the Dodgers, and the A's thought highly of him, but they had to make a decision. What did they need more at the time? The experience of a Willie Randolph at second base or that outfielder, Javier? You mentioned the A's tried to get Harold Baines earlier. They also tried to get Willie Randolph a little earlier. Before he signed with the Dodgers, Sandy Alderson and Tony La Russa took the red eye flight to try to talk him out of it. But the Dodgers offered him more money. Now they've got their man. Here's the one two pitch in tight two and two. A's lead at three to nothing. They scored their three runs in the second inning. Steinbach is at second. McGuire at first. Roger Clemens was ejected. Shouting. Something into Terry Cooney, the home plate umpire. Tom Bolton came in. He's been in there. Round ball. Boggs will step on third for one, and the Red Sox turn their second double play of the ball game. And after four complete, it's three to nothing, Oakland. Two hits allowed by Dave Stewart, and there's no question what his. Great moment was this season. My no hitter um, has been my most memorable moment this season. But at that time, uh, not even seconds after I, I was finished with the ball game, 
Uh, the first thing I thought of was Nolan Ryan and throwing six no-hitters. And the hard work and the accomplishments of throwing six, and I had just thrown one, and it seemed like the greatest thing in the world. And you know, it was the greatest thing in the world for that guy. And uh, Stewart having a career kind of season, facing Dwight Evans, low ball one. I think the hugs that he gets from his teammate, as opposed to the high fives from his teammates, that tells you how much they respect and love this guy. His teammates were as happy about that no hitter as he was. Inside, Evans was robbed of a hit when Willie Randolph made a fine over the shoulder catch in short right field back in the second inning. Fastball wrapped to third. Fair ball backhanded by Lansford off balance. McGuire holds on and a fine play by both Lansford and McGuire. Unbelievable. Now here's two guys Lansford and McGuire that a few years ago McGuire was going to play third. Lansford was going to play first. But there again from that position he gets that quick first step looks the ball into the glove and then a little jump pass and a great pick by McGuire. Here's Bernanski who takes a strike. How does Evans feel after being robbed by Randolph his first time up and then Lansford who was way off balance and McGuire held on to that bounce throw. So there was one away here in the fifth inning three to nothing A's. Bernanski with a fastball fouls it back and it's 0 and 2. He took a call third strike his first time up. That's the only strikeout chalked up thus far by Dave Stewart. Tough luck for Dwight Evans, who has had to face Dennis Eckersley and fan twice against him in the series. More seeds. <laughs> More sunflower seeds. Red Sox are going to have to make some decisions after this season regarding some of their outfielders. Bernanski is a free agent, and Dwight Evans. He's been a DH, has had back problems. Line drive center field. Henderson is there. Fine catch by Henderson. Great play by Dave Henderson, and the A's are just having a remarkable series defensively. Big story in their victory so far. Once again, a well hit ball by Bernanski, but then what looks like a rather ordinary catch and it seems like maybe we overstate it but these guys make the plays better than any other team two down and Quintana takes ball one so three sparkling defensive plays already executed by the A's here who lead three to nothing in behind Dave Stewart two balls and no strikes to Quintana 0 for 12 in the series. Missed and it's 3 and 0. Oh. Stewart has not walked a batter. Balls behind 3 and 0 oh to Quintana. And he lost him, and Quintana's aboard. Two out walk. You mentioned the changes that the Red Sox may have to make. And Quintana would be involved in that. If they don't re sign Bernanski, he would be the right fielder, and they have a fine young. Prospect Mo Vaughn out of Seton Hall had a big year at Pawtucket. In fact, many thought that he would be here playing for the Red Sox in September. He's not, but I think he'll be there next year. He had 22 homers and drove in 72 runs, hit just about 300. Rivera 0 for 1. Breaking ball in there, 0 and 1. The count to Lewis. Mo Vaughn is. Virtually certain to be the first baseman on this club next year. That's the way the Red Sox people talk. Breaking ball misses inside. One ball, one strike. Seems like every game, no matter how good the pitcher, they have one inning where they're a little out of sync, and that's Stewart's case this inning. More high breaking balls than the walk to Quintana. Way Lansford gets ready for the pitch. Breaking ball in, one and two now. And a pop foul out of play. 
why earlier I said the A's had been flawless in the field and they have looked that way. They have made one error in the series that by the guy who you least expect to make one Walt Weiss the shortstop bobbled one. And then again it seems like when the A's do make an error in that particular case that loaded the bases their pitchers get the big out. And make the error. With no uh, impact on the game. Is that elephant that Pat O'Brien talked about during the pregame show? Symbol of the A's. Connie Max stays on. Left side of the infield and a nice little logo behind home plate. Here's the one-two pitch from Stewart. And the count is even now two and two to Rivera. Two down, Quintana the runner at first base. The A's lead it three to nothing as the Red Sox bat here in the top of the fifth inning. Win for Oakland would send them on to the World Series against the survivor of the Reds and the Pirates. Foul out of play, and of course, game five coming your way tonight on CBS at 8 o'clock. With the Reds leading three games to one. Field. Ricky Henderson going back takes the catch. He made a fine running play going the other way yesterday. No runs, no hits. One left, a fine defensive inning for the A's, and it's three to nothing in the middle of the fifth. Back here in Oakland, Dick Stockton along with Jim Cott. Game four of the American League Championship Series, and the A's lead the Red Sox three to nothing. Oakland batting in the fifth against left-hander Tom Bolton. Mike Gallego takes a call strike. He doubled over the head of center fielder Ellis Burks in the second inning and drove in two runs. Jeff Gray, who was up earlier, is throwing again for the Red Sox. Takes a curveball in there for a strike two. Well, it doesn't appear to be any concern for Dave Stewart, but you know he's coming back on four days rest in a tough game in game one of this series and he did not have an effective fifth inning for him. So that bears watching. Diego fouls off a breaking pitch. And Bolton's been pitching pretty well. He gave up that two run double to Gallego. Other than that has handled things pretty well has struck out three batters and has a lot of those right handed hitters off balance with the breaking stuff. I have a feeling that entire team is kind of numb. It's very difficult to keep their focus in on what they're doing. Curveball bounced to third base and Wade Boggs has the play across the diamond to Quintana and there's one away in the A's fifth inning. Now Boggs though doesn't get a lot of credit for it has become one of the better defensive third basemen in the American League. I mean he is out every day at the same time taking ground ball after ground ball. When he first came up they said well he can hit but he can't field. He, can he is among the best down there right now. Don't forget the back has been bothering him. Couldn't get down all the way on some of those grounders earlier. Here's Ricky Henderson, one for two. Ball one to Henderson, who was singled and struck out. Two balls and no strikes to Ricky. Four and a half years in a Yankee uniform. A lot of times it was his attitude. The fans and the management didn't like the way he carried himself and acted. The Yankees questioned his desire to play when he had a hamstring injury. We've talked about that and the fact that he doesn't want to burn himself out. A's are happy. Tony La Russa likes the way he thinks and acts and hits and runs. Fastball and it's three balls in one strike. Two stolen bases behind Lou Brock and keep in mind he's done it in a thousand fewer games. All four and Henderson's aboard with one out here in the fifth inning. Well, it's, a, it's an argument baseball fans love to get involved in but I would say the best leadoff man in baseball history Ricky Henderson when you take into account all the things he can do. 
Joe Morgan's coming out to the mound and Jeff Gray already running in from the bullpen. And Bolton on short notice has done a fine job. The A's lead at three to nothing. But we're looking at Jeff Gray the third pitcher of the game for the Boston Red Sox and we'll return to Oakland after these messages. As you look across the bay to San Francisco the Goodyear blimp Columbia providing those fine pictures today in the Bay Area Tom Mattis of Huntington Beach California the pilot. The new pitcher is Jeff Gray making his second appearance in the series he worked two thirds of an inning when the Red Sox used six hurlers when Roger Clemens started in game number one. Throw to first base and Henderson is back and Dave Henderson is the batter. Ricky Henderson will check Jeff Gray a couple of times he stole third base against Gray the other night very high leg kick and easy to steal against trying to keep him close and in any event he is a deliberate worker on the mound a vendor's delight <laughs> Ball on the corner for a strike. 0 and 1. Dave Henderson is 0 for 2 this afternoon. Renee Latchman. With a 3 0 lead. Henderson with an opportunity here. He's got the green light, does not go. Bluffed going, and it's fouled off by Henderson, and then it's 0 and 2. Ricky on, and Dave is at the plate. Well, they call it the slide step. Watch his front leg. Instead of picking it all the way up, they just pick it up slightly and then slide toward home plate. And of course, that's designed for guys like Jeff Gray to deliver the ball to Tony Pena just a little quicker. Anderson has been successful on one of two attempts in this series. One out in the A's fifth inning. There goes Henderson and the ball is drilled foul. Right beyond the Oakland dugout. Strike two. Hey you see the even the players in the field kind of. Yeah, a little yawning. It's it's tough on guys like that playing behind slow workers. That's why sometimes you see the better plays against quick workers because they get a, a quick first step. Wonder how you can yawn in a fourth <laughs> game of a series like this, but uh, you're out there in the sun and the pitcher's taking his time. Henderson pops it up and a play for Wade Boggs with a tough sun on the high sky. And he makes the play for the second out. Henderson holds first. Well, your glove really acts as another pair of sunglasses or a sun shield because Boggs, even with the glasses, uses the glove right there, and he will look the ball right into the pocket of the glove, using the glove to, of course, shade his eyes from the sun. We've talked about that before here in Oakland, a high sky on these clear, bright days. Here's Canseco. He does have two hits in the series, but none today. He's 0 for 2. Took a call third strike his last time up. Big cut and misses, and strike one. And Tony Larusa before the game said, you know, just Jose just does not look right to me. Keeps putting him in the lineup every day because he is such a threat. Even if he gets on with a single, he's a base dealer, but he's not swinging the way the home run hitting Jose Canseco does. Of course, he's got the bad back and the jam thumb. One of the great attractions, though, in the American League because of his ability to crush the ball when he makes contact. Ricky Henderson on at first base with two down here in the bottom of the fifth inning. The traction is important to base runners. Watch Ricky Henderson dig that left foot in. See, when he gets his lead, he will push off with that left foot, just like a sprinter would use the starting block. 
Here goes Ricky. The pitch is taken for a ball. The throw to second and in with a stolen base is Henderson. going to get another argument. Tony Pena with that smile on his face. He thinks he got him. I mean, Greg did his job, delivered it quickly. Look at those powerful strides and then the ability to hit first slide and still keep your body in contact with the bag. But he was definitely safe. Just got the hand in ahead of the tag. Again, see him push off with that left foot. Wow, look at those strides. Reed makes a nice play, short hopping the ball, catches Henderson in the helmet, but the hand is on the base when he tags it. Yeah, Reed wasn't looking at the base, so I could see where he thinks I got the ball and it was right on his helmet, but the hand was there. And the second stolen base of the series for Ricky Henderson. Count is one ball and one strike to Canseco. The A's are team that can run and the Red Sox not. That's why the big gap in stolen bases. And going around, yes, says Vic, Vic Voltaggio. Canseco swung and the count now to Jose is one and two as much controversy as we've had with umpiring today to their credit they are right a majority of the time and that was an example on a very tough call Larry McCoy made the right call. Well we haven't discussed their calls as much as judgment yeah. in the case of Roger Clemens ejection back in the second inning. Anderson on at second. Here's the one two pitch to Canseco. Got to keep that sun from beating down on you, so you make do. Be a little creative, like Joe Morgan hopes that his offense can in the last four innings of this game. Well, you pointed out when Stewart finished the last inning, you didn't think he was that right, and it'll be interesting to see how he pitches when he comes out again in the sixth. Yeah, because this has been another long wait for him. And Seiko stays alive, and it's the ball and two strike. Well, you can see after that swing, he just shook his right hand down and winced. And he knows that's the pitch when he first came up. You'd come out early and watch him take batting practice. That's the pitch that he hit 500 feet to left field like Bo Jackson does now. And right now, he just can't get the barrel of the bat around to it. Thus the exaggerated open stance. Breaking ball low. Two balls and two strikes. To Canseco, who was third in the league this year with 37 home runs. MVP two years ago. There's Ricky Henderson, who should be the MVP this year. Here's the 2-2 pitch. Foul back. I'm sure there's a lot of Detroit fans, and, and they're right. They're going to support Cecil Fielder and I would say the MVP voting which is already in and will be announced after the World Series I would say it's going to be very very close between Henderson and Fielder but I I would say Ricky might win it by a small margin just a guess as an offensive impact player none better you said maybe the best leadoff hitter of all time of 28 homers 65 stolen bases but Fielder well, that, those numbers are big when you get that 51 home run total. Three and two now to Canseco with two out. I do believe this, the fact that Fielder did not play for a winning team should have no influence, I think, on this vote. You're right, but it does, unfortunately. Pickoff attempt. Covering was Reed. Otherwise, Andre Dawson and Hank Sauer back in 1952 never would have won it. Wish they'd change the name of the award and pick a guy like Joe DiMaggio. Call it the Joe DiMaggio Award Player of the Year. Best offensive performance of the year. And then Fielder would win. Swing and a miss. Strike three. 
And we'll return to the Oakland Coliseum after this message and a word from your local station. You know, the great thing about baseball, Jim, is that, as you well know, you never know what you're going to see in a game. Here it's game four, and you think you're going to see a great pitching matchup, and all of a sudden, a bizarre thing happens. Clemens ejected in the second inning, which has changed the complexion of this whole tilt. Yeah, it's really too bad, because if you're a fan, as all of us, you anticipate that great du duel, and the ejection, of course, gets Roger Clemens out early. And once again, all the other games, the focus has been on the great A's play on defense, and now that's taken something away from the focus of this game and I think it's a challenge to these players to get back into it and they've done a good job since the second inning Bolton did a good job Stewart is hanging in there top of the order in the sixth inning and we'll have a new right fielder Jose Canseco has left the game and Doug Jennings has gone in to play right field it's Jennings first appearance in the LCS Ellis Burks the batter takes a strike he's 0 for 2 this afternoon and at this point the Oakland pitching staff has a 0.84 earn run average and they've held the Red Sox to a 186 batting average in the series popped up foul territory and it'll be out of play two strikes to Ellis Burks. Reed and box to face Dave Stewart who has allowed only two hits thus far. He has walked one and struck out one. Round ball to the right side to Randolph makes the play and there's one down. And right now let's send you down to Jim Gray a report on what the sun's doing down there Jim. All right Dick it's very bright like you and Jim were talking about but I spoke to Ricky Henderson before the game he says all you got to do is have your gear. You put these patches on. You throw down your glasses, you can see everything. He says, that's the theory. He says, unfortunately, that theory doesn't always work. It is pretty bright out here. Let's go back upstairs to Dick and Jim. Thank you, Jim. You look good down there in that shading and so forth. Like Darth Gray. <laughs> <laughs> Jody Reed, who is 0 for 2 this afternoon, 1 for 13 in this series. There's a strike. Reed was around. 300 a good part of the year but kind of tired carry the Red Sox is their catalyst for a good part of the season the first two batters in the Red Sox order are a combined one for 27 in this series that's not setting the table too well is it Curveball, Stewart wanted. That was close. Yeah, and every time you see a graphic like that, depending on which side you're on, you could call it bad hitting or good pitching. And I think in this series, it's been excellent pitching. Fly ball down the left field line. Mike Gallego you know, gives way to Ricky Henderson, who makes the catch for the second out. I think the one opportunity the Red Sox had as far as pitching matchups was yesterday's game when Mike Moore, who came in with a little shaky confidence perhaps in a losing record going against Boddicker one of the Red Sox best and Boddicker pitched he pitched a winning game a couple of errors the Red the A's got two unearned runs but Mike Boddicker pitched as well as the Red Sox could have hoped. It's just Moore and the Oakland bullpen pitched just a, a shade better. Wade Boggs has been a beacon in the night offensively for the Red Sox as the only home run in the series seven hits which is about which is a third of the Red Sox 21 hits in the series takes a call strike one and one and has played terrific third base as well two and one there was that death stare they call it Johnny Sane former pitching coach of mine in Minnesota used to say judge your teammates by if you had to go into battle do you want him there with you. And when you look at Stewart in a heartbeat three balls in a strike he has walked just one batter one hop back to the mound and a one two three inning for Dave Stewart well he answered the question he came back sharp as attack and we've completed five and a half. Thank you. 
Welcome back to Oakland. Jose Canseco has left the game. He's got tendonitis and a badly bruised right in between his index finger and his second finger on his right hand. Can't grip the bat, can't throw the ball. He's not going to return today. Says he can use some time off. Told me he will be all right for a World Series should they make it. Let's go back upstairs to Dick Stockton. Thank you, Jim. Harold Baines leading off in the sixth inning against Jeff Gray. He's 0 for 2. Takes ball one. Another reason why the A's would like to wrap things up and get some of their people who are not 100% healthy. Of course, waiting to see what happens with Walt Weiss. They'll check him out for a possible World Series appearance. Same with Canseco. Line drive to the opposite field, and it'll drop in front of Greenwell, who was playing deep for Baines in the opposite field. And that is hit number six for the A's. What great plate coverage. Watch Harold Baines go out and extend the bat and take a pitch that's pretty well on the inside outside corner. And you mentioned Greenwell playing a little deep respecting Baines power. And as a result of that depth that's balls a base hit. Time is called by the first base umpire Vic Boltaggio. And Baines is going to go out and we're going to have a pinch runner. Willie McGee going to run for Baines. Huh. Is that impressive or what? You take out Harold Baines and you you pinch run with a former most valuable player in the National League batting champion who can also steal a base. And you lose your starting shortstop and you wind up by having to play Willie Randolph in the infield. Carney Lansford one for two with a single and scored one of the A's three runs. Let's see what Tony La Russa has in mind here looking to sacrifice in the pitch taken for a ball. Perfect opportunity here Lansford can handle the bat and you know about McGee's running ability. And Box plays to first to Jody Reed covering, and the sacrifice is successful. McGee is in scoring position, and uh, Rivera had a run to third base for a while. Nobody was covering third, and McGee for an instant had a shot to go there. Look at Carney Lansford with the bat out in front of the plate. Boy, if all everybody could look at that execution. When you get caught with the bat back inside close to your chest then you foul it off perfect execution by Lansford and here Willie McGee knows there's nobody at third so he's going to force Rivera to get over there in a hurry. So Lansford does his job and the A's have a runner in scoring position with one out. they will bring up the catcher Terry Steinbach who is two for two today as a pair of singles and five hits in the series. Here's that technique we were talking about. See Lansford with the bat out in front of the plate. So when it hits the bat, it, it goes down in fair territory. Jeff Gray, who's the third pitcher of the game for the Red Sox. And a ground ball hit to Rivera. His only play is to first in time. Jody Reed had covered second. For a possible pickoff, and the whole right side of the infield was wide open. They get the out, and McGee moves to third. There's two away. Good play right here by Rivera. Going to his left. And in the off balance, accurate throw. He has been steady in this series. A little shaky near the end of the season, and the Red Sox were a little concerned about his throwing, but no problem here in the championship series. So here's Mark McGuire with two out, and McGee, the runner at third base. A's are still without a home run in this series. Al's off a fastball. McGuire was safe on a fielder's choice and got a run batted in in the second inning and then walked. Grounded to box at third. And the inning is over, and the A's strand McGee at third, and after six complete, it's three to nothing athletics.
The world champion Oakland A's are nine outs away from a series sweep. And the American League pennant for the third straight year. And Dave Stewart, who led the league with 11 complete games. But what about complete games on these staffs? You here? know what? what's one of the amazing things when you look at the two pitching staffs? The guy in the ballpark with the most complete games is Dennis Eckersley. He's got 100. Stewart has 50. Clemens, 65. You don't think of Eck as a complete game starting pitcher, but he was. Here's Mike Greenwell. First pitch line foul down the right field line. If it's one of those questions they put up on a scoreboard, everyone would ooh and ah when they put the answer. Yeah. Greenwell has hit the ball sharply twice today to Randolph and to Dave Henderson and has come up empty not only today but throughout the series. He's 0 for 12. Two balls and a strike. It'll be Greenwell, Pena, and Dwight Evans against Stewart, looking for his second victory in the four games. Woo. Two and two. Charge Terry Clooney's mask. Well, he's taken enough of a beating today. Terry Cooney, the home plate umpire. Checking his mask to see if anything was knocked loose. Red Sox, also Marty Barrett was thrown out along with Roger Clemens as they threw out uh, some barrels of Gatorade at the umpires in a big display of displeasure to say the least pretty good only 75 pitches into the seventh inning slice down the left field line chasing it is Ricky Henderson and it's going to drop out of play Henderson had a long run yeah that pitch count and the high number of strikes is another example of pitchers pitching on the fourth day with three days rest that's so overblown but one of the things it does for you in Stewart's case your control is is sharper and and your pitch count is lower you, you economize your pitches and that's what Stewart has done. What about the four day rotation versus the five. Well the, the Mets pitchers in the late 60s with Seaver Kuzman Gary Gentry Nolan Ryan Jim McAndrew they went to the five man they started doing it in the minor leagues to give their young pitchers a little more rest. But you know for years four days was the common we talk about postseason play you go back to the 50s with Lou Burdett who led the Braves to the title pitched on two days rest Lolich Mickey Lolich of Detroit and Sandy Koufax of the Dodgers did it in the 60s. Slow hit chopper to shortstop Gallego on the run makes the play and there's one down here in the seventh inning was Koufax pitch with two days rest against your club in the Minnesota Twins in 65. There's the stare and the pitch and then the reliable Gallego at shortstop takes the high bounce. Yeah, Koufax not only pitched on two days rest he pitched two complete shutouts on two days rest. Tony Pena hitless today. Ball one, the Red Sox. Start of the year, Joe Morgan said, figured if there was no runaway, it'd be a good race. Sox could be in the pack. All strike, one and one. At the beginning of the year, their need was a fourth and fifth starter, and that's why, as you pointed out, Dana Kicker, Greg Harris, and Tom Bolton really made the year for the Red Sox. Their efforts. Next swing back one and two. Yeah, if you add up the numbers, and we're not going to throw all the numbers at you, but if you add up the numbers of kicker, Bolton, and Harris, winning percentage ERA, it's actually better or comparable to Moore, Sanderson, and Kurt Young of the A's, the three, four, five starters. That's the kind of production they've received from those guys. Up the middle, Randolph charging on the short hop. Fine play by Willie Randolph. He's made a couple of nifty plays in the field today and there are two down in the seventh inning for the Red Sox. Payne is limping. 
uh, getting down to the end of the season. They're going to stretch it out as much as they can, the Red Sox, and it's that last stride, and this happens often. When you hit first base, see, he hit the front part of first base with his spike. You'd like to hit it in the middle. When you hit it on that front edge, watch that left foot. Hits the front part of the bag. Ooh. And he catches his toe just between the bag and the infield dirt. Two down, the bases are clear, and Dwight Evans is the batter, and he takes a strike. Talk about the Oakland pitching staff, the big inning. The A's have had a couple of big innings in this series. They've had a couple of big innings in their pitching staff, better than any staff in baseball at not allowing big innings. Broken bat to third base, Lansford sidearms, and a 1-2-3 inning. Seven in a row set down by Dave Stewart, and we go to the bottom of the seventh inning. CBS Sports coverage of Game 4 of the 1990 American League Championship Series is brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. Clairol Option, great coverage for men. Do it right with Clairol Option. And by Budweiser, the king of beers. Remember, no when to say when. This copyright of telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. That broom could come in handy in a little while for the athletics. A's batting in the bottom of the seventh leading three to nothing. They've out hit the Red Sox six to two. Willie Randolph takes ball one. He has walked hit into a double play and scored a run. Bullpen activity for the Red Sox. Larry Anderson is throwing. Sox have used three pitchers today. Clemens, Bolton, and Gray. Gray in there. And there's a strike one and one. Bolton worked two and two-thirds innings and pitched well, allowed two hits, struck out three, and walked a pair. Gray's given up a hit. ball and two strikes to Randolph talked about Jeff Gray's deliberate style you know Mike Boddicker pitched the deciding game to win the American League East and he had a hard time getting to sleep the night before he said instead of counting sheep I counted the times Jeff Gray pounds the ball into the glove <laughs> and I dropped off to sleep we may have to try that two balls and two strikes to Randolph you know that if we talk about that it's not a criticism of Jeff Gray by any means every pitcher has their own tempo their own pace and his just happens to be very deliberate. Well, he had rock bottom. The Phillies Triple A Farm Club couldn't use him. I don't know where to go after that, but here he is. Pitch misses inside, and a full count now to Randolph three and two. He's riding a nine game winning streak in postseason, including a sweep of the San Francisco Giants in the World Series last year. Here's the 3 2 pitch to Randolph. Grounded to third, foul. Rich Garcia right on it. A little communication. Rich Garcia, the third base umpire, with Terry Cooney. You see the ball hugging the line, and Garcia waits until the ball is past the bag. Then it's his call until it gets to the bag. Terry Cooney's call. Fly ball to right field. Brunanski playing Randolph perfectly makes the play, and there's one away in the seventh inning. looking for their third straight pennant. They would be the fourth team to do it. They did it themselves in 72 through 74 the Yankees. Right after that the Red Sox of course won the pennant in 75. 
Mike Gallego with a double and two trips and two runs batted in. Rouse is foul, and of course, everyone talks about the word dynasty. It's a loosely used term, but Tony LaRusso said, wait till it's over this year, and he met the World Series, and then let's see where we stand. Yeah, they still have some pretty lofty numbers to overtake, overcome with the Oakland teams of the early 70s. They won five consecutive divisions, three world championships. Here's Boggs scooping it up, and there's two away. And how about the Yankees of the 50s from 49 to 1953? The Yankees won five world championships. But uh, the A's are, they're progressing toward that greatness tag that they'd like on their team because they're winning these series in such short fashion. The World Series last year and the Red Sox two years ago in four straight, now on the verge of doing this one in four straight. And of course, in those days, you won the pennant, you went right into the World Series. Now you have to play a playoff before the series. Ricky Henderson, one for two with a single, walked and stole a base his last time up. Fastball is in for a strike. Two to Henderson. Think hitters and ball players don't talk to themselves. That's what Ricky's doing, shaking his head. How'd I miss that pitch? I gotta make him get the ball up. No balls, two strikes, and two outs here in the A's seventh inning. Jeff. Gray's pitch is fouled off. The crowd is seems to be on the verge of starting a little celebration. It'll come slowly, I'm sure. Middle part of the game, uh, many of the people here, not to mention the players, were deflated because of the events earlier when Roger Clemens was ejected in the second inning for shouting something at home plate umpire Terry Cooney. Big furor over that. will have reverberations I think for days to come probably more than days you mentioned the atmosphere of the fans it's here the the feeling is it's not if we win it's just a matter of which day they're kind of sitting back anticipating which day and it looks like it's going to be today Anderson stays alive that was a good pitch for him to hit. He's an aggressive organization, perhaps the envy of many others, willing to take risks, and they seem to pay any price for any player they need. And it's paid off. Did he go around? He did. Strike three, and Henderson strikes out for the second time. He can't believe it. But the inning is over. Here it is again. Did he go around? A strikeout in a 1 2 3 inning, and we go to the eighth. This game summary is sponsored by Budweiser. And the story of this game we haven't had any scoring since the second inning when Roger Clemens was ejected. Marty Barrett as well. The A scored three runs. Stewart sailing along. With a two hitter and we go to the Red Sox eighth the bottom third of the order facing Stewart it'll be Bernanski Quintana and Rivera first pitch ball one Bernanski 0 for 2 called out on strikes and line to center field good play there by Dave Henderson six outs away from their third straight pennant of the A's and the pitch is fouled out of play interestingly enough Jim uh, Clemens went out. Bolton came in and gave up that two run double and the A's have not done anything more offensively but the Red Sox can't get anything going and as we say it Bernanski hits a drive that hooks foul down the left field line and Joe Morgan will say that's been the story of the series for us yesterday Jody Reed let off the game against Mike Moore with a ball that just hooked foul. I mean Bernanski juices this up toward the upper deck and that one's 
about 15 20 feet foul. Broken bat grounder gloved by Lansford wide of third and there's one away. Eight in a row set down by Dave Stewart, as is his custom, getting stronger as the game moves along. Once again, from that position, a chance to get a quick jump on the ball with a lateral movement, and the rest of it pretty routine for Carney Lansford. Ian Boggs have had exceptional series at third base. Here's Carlos Quintana, who is 0 for 12 in a walk, 0 for 12 in the series. Crowd starting to move along now and in the aisles fans are parading with signs. Pitch taken for a ball one and one. You mentioned the acquisition of pitchers. As the broom parade begins its march left over from last year's World Series. How about acquiring Eckersley from the Cubs and Welsh and the Hendersons and Diaz. Yeah they, they only have a couple of pitchers on their staff that were developed in their farm system. Last ball and there's Lansford again at third across to retire Quintana and there's two away and the crowd gets louder with each succeeding put out by the A's. Mentioned back in the fifth inning that Stewart was a little out of sync but the great pitchers get right back in it and now that tempo and that rhythm we talked about the tempo and rhythm of Jeff Gray it's interesting to study Stewart and all of the Oakland pitchers they're influenced by pitching coach Dave Duncan. Get on the rubber, get the sign, think about where I want to throw, and go to work. There's a rhythm to the way they work. Rivera hitless in two times today. Breaking ball, strike one. Fly ball to left field and Ricky Henderson. Shades his eyes and a one two three inning the Red Sox are out in order and the A's are three outs away from their third straight American League pennant. Three to nothing the A's coming up in the last of the eighth inning and once again the view from the top from the Goodyear Blimp Columbia. In the dressing room that is not champagne that's sparkling cider non alcoholic and that's what the A's will celebrate with if they can close the door on the Red Sox. Larry Anderson is the new pitcher for the Red Sox. He is the fourth pitcher for Joe Morgan today. Kind of ironic. That we've talked about the demise of the Boston bullpen. You're looking at the William Harridge Award, the American League Trophy, but the demise of the Red Sox bullpen in the first couple of games. And yet today, what's lost in this excitement is this is just a three to nothing game, and the Red Sox bullpen has kept them in it. David Henderson leading off for Oakland takes a strike on the inside corner. Jeff Gray pitched. Two and two thirds innings allowed one hit and struck out two batters. One and one to Henderson who is 0 for 3 this afternoon. Red Sox use six pitchers in game one. Four pitchers in the second game and Boddicker went the distance yesterday. Lays off the pitch outside two and one to Henderson. I think what Boston has done this season with Roger Clemens Mike Boddicker and then a number of pitchers Larry Anderson being one they really didn't count on or have at the beginning of the season done a great job. Two balls and two strikes. But against the Oakland Athletics. The final analysis pitching and defense. That's how you win championships. And a full count now three and two to Henderson. Well Tony La Russa told us before the game he said I had good vibes early as early as the second day of spring training. Everyone showed up and everyone was in condition. 
And Henderson strikes out one gone. I think that's probably what Tony La Russa should get credit for above all is that he gets this ball club mm -hmm. so prepared from spring training day one on. And that once they take the field, you know, they just kind of react and do what they normally do. He takes care of all the preparation and the drilling and probably does it better than any manager in baseball and has a great coaching staff. And he lets them do their job. He has respect for them. Here's Doug Jennings with his first at bat in the series, went into play when Canseco came out. It's a hopper to Quintana, makes the play unassisted, and there's two out. Looking ahead of the Red Sox ninth, it'll be the top of their order. Burks, Reed, and Boggs. Rack Slider. He's the Red Sox third base coach. Ron Hassey is going to come up and bat in the designated hitter spot. You remember that Willie McGee went in to run for Harold Baines, so here's Hassey. He played in game two and had a base hit. Red Sox took a 1-0 lead in each of the first three games of the series, only to see the A's come back. Today, the Sox never tasted the advantage. Fastball and a strike to Hassey. on the screen the A's have scored 20 runs in the series the Red Sox only three and at this stage that would be the biggest differential since the 1970 championship series by the Orioles over the twins I was on the losing end of those years with the ball clubs with the twins and there is no more devastating loss for a ball player than losing the playoffs or championship series why because You've played 162 games to win your division and you think you've accomplished something and then in one week it's like you've lost it all. A ball and two strikes to Hassey. Drama building here in Oakland even though the A's have a three nothing lead in games and on the scoreboard anytime you clinch something it's major and the A's are on the brink. Dick Stockton and Jim Cott with you. Oakland batting in the last of the eighth inning. Looking for a sweep just as they did in 1988 against the Red Sox. Joe Morgan said the juggled lineup might work. It might not. He did it in 88. Led off with Ellis Burks. The Red Sox got five runs in the first inning of that game, but they still lost. Anderson runs the count full now three and two to Hassey. are under the gun against the Cincinnati Reds at Three River Stadium at 8 o'clock Eastern time. Browning and Drabeck. Doug Drabeck, probable Cy Young Award winner, pitched a great game even though he lost. And Tom Browning in uh, Three River Stadium, high ball pitcher. Pirates hit a lot of balls in the air. And tonight they're going to have to hit a few out to get back in that series. The A's send up a pinch hitter for Ron Hassey. Pinch runner, that is, Lance Blankenship will run for Hassey. Joe Morgan coming out to the mound. Jeff Reardon has been warming up in the bullpen. Arnie Lansford coming up to hit. Joe stretching out his he's not losing sight of the fact that this is just a three to nothing lead and he's got his closer Jeff Reardon 
getting ready down there to at least keep it a three nothing lead going to the ninth. Up until this point the Red Sox may have lost some concentration in games that they had the lead all of a sudden the A's would score seven in the ninth in one game two in the ninth and they let the game get away from them yesterday as well defensively. Morgan doesn't want to see that happen. I think today Roger Clemens ejection was a rallying point for them. They have stayed in this game with remarkable composure but once the A's get that three round lead they're difficult to overcome with Stewart on the mound. Lance Blankenship the pinch runner on at first two down. And Carney Lansford, who is one for two with a sacrifice, knocked out seven hits in this series. Same number struck by Wade Boggs of the Red Sox. There goes the runner, pitch taken for a ball, the throw to second, and safe is Blankenship for the stolen base. Kevin had a lot of opportunity to see Lance Blankenship. He was counted on to replace the valuable utility man Tony Phillips who went to Detroit in the offseason. But in a foot race, Conseco, Ricky Henderson, and Blankenship are right there, one, two, three on this ball club. This guy can run. And as you point out, Joe Morgan knows it's only a three-run game, wants to keep it that way. Tony LaRussa wants more runs. He doesn't think three's enough as Lansford swings and misses one and one. And the A's could be the first team to win postseason play without a home run in 71 years. Al's back the fastball in on the fist one and two. This is Anderson's third appearance in the four games. One and two to Lansford. Blankenship with the lead at second. In 1979, the A's drew just 306,000 fans at home the entire year. How far have they come? This year they drew a record 2,900,000 at the Coliseum. Talk about a turnaround. And as we alluded to earlier, a franchise that there was some talk of moving away from here because of that low attendance back in the late 70s. About one of the healthiest ones around right now. Lance Blankenship has the lead at second. The count is two and two to Carney Lansford. Swing and a miss, strike three, and the inning is over, and now we go to the ninth inning. Three outs away from a title. And welcome back to Oakland. The Red Sox coming up in the ninth inning against Dave Stewart, who has not allowed a runner beyond first base this afternoon. He has given up. Two hits. Wade Boggs has them both, has walked one and struck out one. And it'll be the top of the order for the Sox, Burks, Reed, and Boggs in the ninth inning. Rick Honeycutt has started to throw in the bullpen for the A's. With Boggs and Greenwell hitting third and possibly fourth, Honeycutt might be needed. Here's Burks 0 for 3. And a strike on the outside corner. Stewart has retired 10 straight hitters. No balls and two strikes. 
Last man to reach base with Quintana with a two out walk in the fifth. The last hit, Box, with a single in the fourth. And a ball and two strikes to Ellis Burks. into the corner chasing it is Ricky Henderson and going into second with a double is Ellis Burks and the first extra base hit for the Red Sox in the game off a fastball line drive into the corner and Burks has his second two base hit of this series And there's going to be more activity down in the Oakland bullpen as Ellis Burks is on at second with nobody out. There's Rick Honeycutt, the left-hander, who appeared yesterday and pitched a third of an inning. And Dennis Eckersley, need we say more about him? Here's Jody Reed, who takes a strike. 0 for 3 today, and only one hit in this series. He has struggled. Red Sox do not have a base hit with runners in scoring position in this series. Trailing three to nothing in the top of the ninth inning. Foul back, and Stewart jumps ahead of Reed, 0 and 2. Red Sox looking for another base runner to try to make things interesting here in the ninth, and the A's have. Honeycutt and Eckersley working. One ball and two strikes. Stewart got ahead of Burks 0-2 before Burks lined a double. On deck is Wade Boggs, who has two hits today. But we may not see Stewart against Boggs. Breaking ball just misses, and the count is 2-2. Two and two. two count after getting ahead it's now three balls and two strikes 104 pitches Stewart had thrown 75 pitches through the first six innings and if Reed gets on good chance Honeycutt will come in fouls it out of play Stewart worked eight innings in winning the first game of the series A run in four hits in that game. Three two pitch, lashed foul down the left field line. So, what was billed as another confrontation between Roger Clemens and Dave Stewart never materialized when Clemens was ejected from the game in the second inning for arguing with Terry Cooney. Bolton. Gray and Anderson have come in in relief. Bolton gave up a double to Gallego, and after that, the Red Sox have shut down the door for the A's. And there's a base hit down the right field line. Rounding third is Burks. Retrieving it is Jennings. Burks will score. And on it first with a base hit, it's a 3-1 to one ball game. And that may be all for Dave Stewart. But I would think so with Honeycutt ready in the bullpen for the A's. Reed gets only his second hit of the series and an RBI, and here comes La Russa. And it'll be Honeycutt to come in to face Boggs, and you'll listen to the hand for Stewart. He has pitched marvelously.
back here in Oakland and a pitching change for the A's Dave Stewart who is right there with another brilliant performance going eight innings but tiring here in the ninth and Rick Honeycutt who has made two appearances in the LCS and has faced one batter each time both Mike Greenwell and he's retired them both times. Honeycutt no stranger to postseason play will be facing Boggs and Greenwell two left handed hitters box two for three with a couple of hits runner at first is Jody Reed ball one outside the box three to one the score the A's got all their runs in the second inning and the Red Sox trying to stage a threat here in the ninth. Trying to stave off a four game sweep. Misses. Two balls and no strikes. Mark McGuire is not holding Jody Reed on at first base. He's playing behind him a step. The infield is bunched toward the middle, and Lansford is a step behind third. Round ball up the middle. Randolph playing perfectly. Steps on the bag for one to throw the first in time for the double play. And there are two gone. A big double play for Honeycutt. And the A's are one out away. And Randolph, who was shaded towards second, the veteran who has come in with Weiss injured, Boggs hits into the double play and the bases are clear with two out. Randolph with several sparkling plays in the field. Mike Evans who has been through several of these postseason affairs. And the batter is Greenwell with two out. So the Red Sox are down to their last out and Honeycutt facing Greenwell who is 0 for 3 today has hit the ball sharply on two occasions. Ball one low. Greenwell has not gotten a base hit in the LCS. He is 0 for 13. Swing and a miss. One and one, and that RBI single by Reed was the Red Sox first hit with men in scoring position in the four games. Eckersley has stopped throwing in the red. A's bullpen, he's ready if they need him. And the count goes to two and one on Greenwood. Greenwell keeps it alive for Boston. Tony Pena is the on-deck hitter. And a one hopper fielded by Gallego the throw to first and the ball game is over. for the third consecutive year. Establishes an LCS record, five victories in his career in LCS play. 
And the Oakland A's have taken the first step to what they hope will be back-to-back -back world championships. are American League champions again. They have won 10 straight postseason games. And those brooms come in handy today. Dave Henderson gets to play in another World Series. Oakland beats Boston in four straight, winning today three to one. There are the totals in game four. Stewart wins it. Clemens loses the game, and the big story was his ejection in the second inning, but the Red Sox managed only one run, one run in each of the four games. Well, earlier, Jim Gray got this reaction from Roger Clemens. Right. All right, I'm here with Roger Clemens. What did you say to the umpire? Well, I walked that guy, and I was looking down and shaking my head, and basically I looked up, and he was shaking his head back at me, and uh, I basically said the first time, I'm not talking to you. I'm not shaking my head at you, and I was continuing to shake my head, and then I saw him gesture towards me, and I said, I'm not bleeping talking to you. I'm not shaking my head at you. The next thing I know, I was out of the game, so uh, it might have had something to do with yesterday when he, he blew a call at first base on a check swing, and some guys made uh, some motions towards him then. I don't know, but... I was very surprised. I didn't know I was throwing out the game until after the fact told Tony, let's go. And uh, basically when I walked the guy, I was disturbed about that. And you know, I don't know, I, I, I can't believe it. And uh, it was unbelievable, really. Does the punishment fit the crime? Uh, you're not supposed to curse at an umpire. Well, again, he was motioning to me, and I was just letting him know the first time that I wasn't, I wasn't showing him up or doing anything to him in that manner. So uh, I hope the uh, commissioner, whoever is involved, will get a good look at this, because uh, uh, that's, that's pretty tough right there. And uh, I don't know what it's from. They might as well just hand it over to him. I mean, you know, we've been playing pretty good hard baseball, and if everything works out, we'll see what happens. I'm going to ice my arm, and hopefully we can win today. I'll pitch tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Roger. All right. Let's go back upstairs to Dick Stockton. And that was earlier, but in the final analysis, even though that stunned a lot of people, the Red Sox only scored one run in this game. We'll be back with more from the Oakland Coliseum in just a moment. The Oakland A's have swept the Red Sox and have won their third straight American League pennant, winning here 3-1. to one. And now for the trophy presentation, let's go down to the Oakland Clubhouse and Jim Cott. Jim? Well, Dick, a happy Oakland Clubhouse, as you might imagine, and my privilege to introduce Dr. Bobby Brown of the American League, who will present the American League trophy to Walter E. Haas, Jr., owner and managing partner of the Oakland A's, and also manager Tony La Russa. Dr. Brown? Thanks, Jim. Walter, Tony? I present the championship trophy for a job extremely well done, both all during the season and, of course, in the playoffs. Most convincing, and you have a great team. Uh, thank you, Bobby. American League champions three years in a row, fantastic. It takes talent and takes character, and the Oakland A's have both. Tony, thanks. This is yours. <laughs> I, I love to hold it. it. I love to take it. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, your comments. It takes talent and it takes character. Also, it takes a good manager. No, this is a club that you just tell them what time the game starts and where you're playing. Uh, I think the best thing about this club is, is the character, really. I mean, the other clubs have talent, but uh, it's just unbelievable the way this club gets ready all season long. And then in the postseason, they, they pick it up a notch or two. It's just I'm so proud of them. And probably one area of baseball team that goes unnoticed is the great job that your coaches do in helping this team get prepared. Well, you know, I think we'll always remember that ninth inning, uh, double play ball. We played Boggs to the middle. He beat us a couple of times in the hole, but we played him in the middle. Willie got the double play. And then that last out that Gags played, you know, here another well-hit ball. But, you know, all that work the coaches do, we get important outs. Congratulations, Tony La Russa, Mr. Haas. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And now also my privilege to introduce Don Oberg of the Chevrolet Motor Division. And he has a... Uh, uh, an award that he'd like to present to the most valuable player of this American League Championship Series. Don? Dave, on behalf of Chevrolet and Major League Baseball, I'm proud to present you the 1990 Most Valuable Player Award. Chevrolet will also donate a uh, Chevy Astro or S10 Blazer in your name to the charity of your choice. Congratulations, Thank Dave. You very much. Thank you very there much. Hold it up. Hold it up. 
Dave, congratulations on the Most Valuable Player Award and also uh, setting a record five wins, championship series. Every pitcher seems to go through maybe one inning, and yours was the fifth, a little out of sync, but like all the great ones, right back on target. Well, I you know, just try to do my best. I try to come out and find a way to, to keep us in the ball game and you know, give us a chance to win, and you know, I was just fortunate to be able to you know, feel my way through that inning. Some comments about Tony La Russa and this entire team and the way you guys continue to perform at a championship level year after year. It's not that easy. Well, it's not easy, but, you know, Tony to me is the best manager in the game. And, you know, we, we work hard from first day of spring training and every day during the course of the year. And it, it helps us keep focused on what we need to do. And, you know, this, this ball club is as good as we're managed. What was the atmosphere in the dugout and you personally right after Clemens' ejection? Well, I... You know, was on the field, and I heard some of the comments that you know, were made towards home plate umpire. And you know, Clemens is definitely a class act in the game, but I think emotions may have gotten away from him a little bit. And really, there's no place for that in this game. But you know, it happened, and you know, for us, it was just a matter of taking advantage of the opportunity, which you know, we brought Bolton in. He was kind of cold, and Gagman hit the hit the double, and and that put us out in front. Congratulations, Dave Stewart, the American League champion, Oakland A's. Let's go back upstairs to Dick Stockton. All right, Jim, thank you. Uh, Dave Stewart, winner of Game 1 and Game 4, the MVP. And we'll return to the Oakland Coliseum after this message and a word from your local station. And let's right now go back for more from the winning Oakland A's dressing room and Jim Cott. Jim? All right, thanks a lot, Dick. Two members of the American League champion A's, Jose Canseco, on my left. And I guess the question is your physical condition going into the World Series. My physical condition is somewhere around 80%. My back feels pretty good. I've had a problem with my right hand with an injury I had on one of the fingers. Uh, I've got some swelling in there. It bothers me on some of the swings, so I'm glad we wanted him for. I'll have a couple, two, three, four days to rest the hand, and I'm sure it'll be 100% by the World Series. Heal up and have a good World Series. And on my right, Carney Lansford doesn't get all the ink that a lot of the stars on the Oakland A's do. Nevertheless, what, a, what an important member of this ball club and great defense and this keeps getting better every year for you doesn't it yeah it does jimmy thank you very much these guys do get a lot of credit and they just you know they get it deservingly so they do an outstanding job some of the numbers and things that they've accomplished and you know it's such a short period of their career it's just unbelievable so they deserve everything they get congratulations to carney lansford unselfish member of this championship ball club now let's go over to jim gray he visits with boston manager joe morgan okay thank you very much jim i'm here with joe morgan manager of the red sox joe I know there's disappointment. You had a great year beating out Toronto. Can anybody beat the A's in the National League? Congratulations, Tom and Tony. They're just a, a terrific machine. There's no question about it. Well, can anyone beat them? Sure. The Dodgers did it, didn't they? They're the same outfit. The disappointment. Obviously, you guys were a step ahead of the division, a mile ahead of expectations. Does that cushion this at all? The only thing that's hard to take is not even winning one game. In a series like this, if you can win one game, then you're getting the kind of pitch and you're getting things could ch uh, turn around. But we couldn't even do that. Okay, Joe, thanks for joining us. Right very on, gracious right in on. defeat. Let's go back upstairs to Dick Stockton. All right, Jim Gray, thank you very much. And we'll be sending it back to Pat O'Brien at our New York studios after these messages. And so as we congratulate the Oakland A's, a reminder that we'll be back in just a short while, just under an hour and 20 minutes at 8 o'clock Eastern time with Game 5 of the Reds and the Pirates and the NLCS. I'm Pat O'Brien in New York City. We'll see you back here around supper time. CBS Sports coverage of Game 4 of the 1990 American League Championship Series has been brought to you by Toyota's quality line of cars and trucks. Toyota, I love what you do for me. Michelin, because so much is riding on your tires. And by AT&T, the right choice. You've been watching Major League Baseball on CBS Sports, the home of the League Championship Series and the World Series.